Responsible for the 9,200 aliens with criminal convictions crossing the border illegally just this year to date? Nope. Is China responsible for the estimated 1.5 million illegal alien gotaways that cross the border undetected under your watch? Nope. Is China responsible for the 1.2 million removable aliens who have been told by a judge that they must leave the U.S. but insist on staying? Secretary Marcus, it is your responsibility to secure our border against fentanyl trafficking. The fentanyl killing thousands of Americans every year is a direct result of your dereliction. When people die of fentanyl poisoning, it is your fault. What would you say to Stephanie Granados' family if they were here right now? Congressman, uh, we grieve the loss of any life as a result of the toxicity, the devastation of fentanyl. The challenge of fentanyl is not new. It has been escalating for more than five years. I believe there were more than 50,000 overdose deaths from fentanyl in 2020. This is a scourge that all of us have to work together to combat. And we in the Department of Homeland Security, with our federal partners, are taking it to the traffickers to an unprecedented degree through innovative operations targeting criminals. And I stand by my statement at Aspen that China does bear responsibility because many of the precursor chemicals and the pill press equipment that are used to manufacture fentanyl does originate from there. This is a complex problem. We are taking it to the criminals, and I look forward to working with you, Congressman, to address this challenge, which has been only building over many years in this country. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. General Lee from Texas, recognized. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. Uh, you have repeatedly been before us and indicated your humble beginnings uh, and the passion and commitment in which you serve America and take very seriously your job here as Secretary of Homeland Security. Uh, on that basis, I have a number of uh, quick questions that I'm going to ask for um, a sense of urgency and rapidness so that I can assure that um, all have been answered. First of all, I want to make clear that this is an oversight hearing, not an impeachment hearing. Uh, this is a hearing to address the questions of the work that has been done. Uh, and so to that end, just as a factual basis, uh, there's been a lot of hollering about the entry on the border, operational control. And I'm asking for a brief question. We know that the federal government ended Title 42. Have crossings gone down? Yes, they have. The approach that we have taken, Congresswoman, of expanding lawful pathways, safe, orderly, and lawful pathways for individuals, and at the same time delivering consequences to those who do not take advantage of those lawful pathways. And part of that has been working. The challenge, of course, remains. Uh, my numbers suggest 70 percent that they've gone down, and it also suggests that the Biden administration has put in stricter requirements for asylum. Is that correct? Uh, we, we did. We are delivering consequences for those who do not take advantage of the lawful pathways. But you still believe in the humane uh, infrastructure of America that started with the Statute of Liberty uh, and realizing people flee persecution, uh, political dynasties, if you will, uh, that uh, cause violence uh, and uh, a uh, forcing of leaving. Is that, your, is that uh, part of our thinking here in the country? Congresswoman, um, our laws, our refugee laws, our asylum laws are uh, one of our proudest traditions as a country of refuge. So would you say, uh, having been asked this over and over again, uh, that the United States, the President of the United States, the Secretary of Homeland Security, and all of the hardworking men and women uh, at the border uh, have operational control or have a form of, of, um, uh, of, of presence? Uh, that they are aware of what's going on in the border and that they're working to secure the border every single day. As we define that term, Congresswoman, we do. CISA, um, it, CISA, excuse me, um, has been uh, called uh, all things, uh, maybe even uh, not American. Is it an important element of securing elections as it did in the 2020 election in 2022? The security of elections, uh, our election system is um, a component of our country's critical infrastructure 
to protect the safety, security, and integrity of the election process is a significant priority uh, of this government. And the, and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency works very closely with election officials in state and local jurisdictions to ensure the safety and security of the election system. I have two more questions, and I must quickly move forward. The ADL has uh, indicated uh, that there have been uh, 3,697 anti-Semitic incidences, 36% increase uh, from 2021. What is your department doing to protect the Jewish community and within the new U.S. national strategy to counter anti-Semitism? Um, what kind of commitments um, have you made? And I have another question, So, uh, but I, I think this is extremely important. Congresswoman, um, there has been a rise uh, in anti-Semitism in this country, the rise in other ideologies of hate. Our responsibility as the Department of Homeland Security is when there is a connectivity between an ideology, whatever that ideology might be, and violence. It is the prevention of violence that really um, prompts uh, our engagement with local communities around the country. Thank you. I want to keep uh, in touch uh, on those issues. We all face uh, communities who are certainly um, uh, targets of that kind of violence. Um, I want to um, suggest that immigration is uh, a national uh, and federal uh, authorized responsibility. Uh, we see states like Texas and Florida uh, that have spent billions in Texas uh, that have bused uh, individuals to the vice president's home uh, and to other places. Uh, can you tell me um, how uh, detrimental in questioning uh, states getting involved in immigration issues and how confident you feel that you are um, protecting the American people uh, and incidences like that, including incidences at the border, which I'll put in um, a, a record. Texas trooper alleges inhumane treatment of migrants by state officials along the southern border. But how you are responding uh, to that responsibility that you have? Congresswoman, the safety and security of the American people is our highest priority. Um, law enforcement is mo most effective when it is executed collaboratively in cooperation. Time of the Wait, job. I'd like to ask unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, to place into the record um, the uh, CBS News, July 18, Texas Trooper alleges inhumane treatment of migrants by state officials along the southern border, um, and Washington Post, southern border eerily quiet after policy <coughs> ship on asylum uh, seekers. I ask unanimous consent to place uh, that into the record. That objection. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida for five minutes. Two million encounters and releases under your watch. So not including the Title 42 expulsions, not including violent criminals. Of those two million plus that you've encountered and released, how many have you told to go home? Um, uh, Congressman, uh, individuals who are released are placed in immigration enforcement proceedings under the law where they can make their claim for relief. If their claim for relief is not satisfied, they are subject to removal from the United right. States. Right, subject to removal sounds very different than actually removed. So I'm not interested in the process, I'm not interested in what people are subject to. <laughs> Two million people encountered and released, not the expulsions under Title 42, not the criminals. How many of those people have you deported? So, uh, Congressman, a few points. Number one. Just how many of the people? I just want to know how many. It's just I a may. number. Congressman, uh, we are dealing with a completely broken immigration system. I get system. it. I, no, 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 Mr. Secretary, I'm not going to let you burn my five minutes. Do you know the answer? Do you know the number of people out of that two million that you've removed that aren't criminals? I do know that okay. we have removed more aggravated felons. Right, I'm not asking about them. You, you, I, I've caveated that away. Because here's what I'm, I'm sort of getting and what your non-responsiveness is demonstrating. The Mayorkas doctrine is this. If you show up at the border and get released into the country, if you don't commit a specific aggravated felony, which by the way, doesn't include a lot of assault and battery, doesn't include a lot of bad domestic violence, but if you're not one of the people who commit those crimes, you get to stay forever. Is, is that a fair characterization of your doctrine? No, that is false. Then tell me how many you're sending home. No, that is false. Okay, well, they, but you don't know the number of how many you've sent home. Here's another number. Two point, I'm sorry, 1.2 million people today have been through your entire process, right? They've been through what you call a removal proceeding is just an amnesty dance. Because after the 1.2 million people get an order from the judge 
saying that they don't have a basis to be here, you still don't remove them. Like, what's your plan to remove those people? Congressman, that is false. Okay, what, how many of them then? Just Cong give me the number. Congressman, in this country, in this country, there are between 11 and 12 million. Right, but I'm asking about a subset that you won't send home. And the reason you're smirking about it, and the reason you won't answer my question, is because everybody gets the joke. And the sad thing is, it's not just us here, it's the cartels who get the joke too. And so now, what you've done to execute this Mayorkas doctrine, where so long as you don't commit a crime, you get to stay here and burden our hospitals, burden our schools, burden our social services, burden our jails. You've sent the message to the cartels, and then you've taken this app, and you've digitized illegal immigration, and you've scaled it to the moon. Like, this app that you've got everybody downloading is like the Disney fast pass into the country, never to be subject to actual removal, just removal proceedings, as you call them. That app doesn't do any search of their criminal history in their home country, does it? Congressman, I, I disagree with everything you have well, said. I'm sure, but just to answer the question, does the app that you are out there promoting do any search of people's criminal history in their home country? Congressman, Customs and Border Protection screens and vets individuals whom they encounter. Your early. app, it either has the functionality to test their criminal history in their home country or it doesn't. By the way, if it did, you'd have already told me. It doesn't. And then the other epic failure of this that's empowered the cartels is that in these processing centers you've set up in other countries to just wave them all in at a rapid pace, the, you've had to shut them down in Nuevo Laredo because the cartels were standing outside extorting people. Isn't that right? Congressman, that is false. Oh, really? So why did you shut down that facility in Nuevo Laredo? Congressman, the, the point of safe, orderly, and lawful pathways is to reduce the number of encounters at our southwest border. But, but wait a second. You've, been, you, you, what, you've just shifted those encounters. Because right now, for the first time in modern history, more people are showing up at the ports of entry than running through some bush in Yuma, Arizona. And the reason they're showing up at the ports of entry is because you've got the turnstile open. Where so long as they've gone and downloaded this app, you just let them in. I got one final question for you, and it's an important one. Is Mexico an ally in this fight against illegal immigration? Uh, yes, it is. So, I mean, it's hilarious and somewhat troubling that you say that, because like I'm looking at the El Chapo trial, where President Nieto took a $100 million bribe from the Sinaloa cartel. Do you think that the subsequent presidents following Nieto weren't offered a bribe by the cartel or didn't take the bribe? Congressman, I, I disagree with everything you have said. Uh, right, right but, well, worked... but you can disagree all you want, but what you won't provide is any number. And when, when you sit there and just kind of ostensibly disagree without any facts, it shows people what the real gig is. The Mexican government is captive to the cartels. They are doing the bidding of the cartels, and based on your response today, so are you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, appreciate your service and uh, appreciate your testifying today. Last week, Director Ray sat in the uh, hot seat. Uh, is this, it, by the way, is it still warm or did you bring some, some uh, pot holders? I, I am prepared to answer the questions of this committee. Thank you, sir. Uh, Director Ray testified that a lot of the animus that has been conjured up against government uh, in this Congress particularly, but around the country, have given white supremacists the, the belief that their actions may be justified. And it's hurt morale at his agency, and it's jeopardized the lives of some of his agents. Uh, the situation in Cincinnati where a man went out and he didn't kill anybody, but he tried to, he was gonna go to the Cincinnati base, and there have been others. Has your division of government, uh, Homeland Security, been affected? The employees' morale been affected? by these white supremacist threats and statements, and have you been, the, any of your agents and uh, sites been the victim of violence? Uh, Congressman, it is the um, anti-government uh, sentiments uh, and their connectivity to violence uh, that is the subject of my discussions with many of our frontline personnel's personnel and the threats that they have encountered as a result. Have, has there been any violence directed at, at any of your sites? There has, and we have um, an agency within the Department of Homeland Security, the Federal Protective Service, uh, remarkable men and women in uniform who protect federal facilities and the personnel who work in them. 
there was a court ruling yesterday, and I didn't get into depth, but I believe it suspended a program that, that the president, and that and I includes you, uh, tried to have to, for border uh, entry and who could come to this country and seek asylum and, and limit it to some extent. And it was uh, stayed, I believe, by a, a court. Is that is that correct? Yes, Congressman. It's the circumvention of lawful pathways regulation that we promulgated as part of our process to expand lawful pathways uh, for individuals and at the same time deliver consequences for those who do not use those pathways. Were there similarities to the program that the President Biden and, and, and you uh, had stayed that President Trump had also tried to implement or did implement? It is a different program than the one that uh, President Trump implemented, Congressman. Okay. Did it have any any parts of it? No. The the um, uh, uh, and I will not uh, speak much about this, Congressman, because the matter is the subject of litigation. Uh, but uh, President Trump issued a transit ban on individuals, and our regulation is not a ban. It shifts the evidentiary burden, it raises it, and creates a rebuttable presumption, which is quite distinct from a ban. Could you say that was a middle ground between what President Trump had and what the court maybe wanted because the court stated and didn't allow it to occur? Congressman, I, I, I'm, I'm not, not able to. Anywhere. I'm not able to, to comment any further, given the fact that it's a matter of pending litigation. Thank you, sir. Uh, I've had a problem, which is more local in nature, I guess. Constituents who've complained that the uh, uh, opportunity to get uh, certified by the Global Entry Program in Memphis, Tennessee, has been thwarted. That they've been told they need to go to Jackson, Tennessee, and uh, Memphis is a city of over a million people. Jackson's a city of about a hundred thousand. Why our, our folks would have to go to Jackson to get their global entry form is hard for me to comprehend. They said that they, they, had, they had to travel there. We've tried to get in touch with the people at Global Entry. I think we got a phone call Friday, but we found it very difficult to get in touch. The phone number that we were given by some people uh, with uh, uh, TSA uh, as a kind of a speedy number, the number we need to get action. Uh, my staff said that they, the phone was hardly ever answered. They mostly stayed on hold. Uh, could you ask the folks, because they come under you at, at, at Global Entry, to look into why citizens in Memphis have to go to Jackson? They were told us because some other people have to work for help FedEx. Everybody should help FedEx. But besides that, they need to help the citizens of Memphis get their global entries as well. So can you look into that for me? I will, Congressman. Uh, the Global Entry Program is one of two trusted traveler programs. Global Entry is under U.S. Customs and Border Protection, and PreCheck is under the Transportation Security Administration. Those are two very successful trusted traveler programs that enhance the security of travel in the United States, as well as facilitated that travel. I'd be pleased to look into that issue. Thank you, sir. And are you are you from Miami? No, I was uh, I was born in Cuba and fled the communist takeover of Cuba to the United States. You didn't come to Miami at all. I did. We we lived in Miami for a couple of years before my father found work elsewhere. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm in the same status, except I didn't go to Cuba first, but I did go to Miami, and then my father found better employment elsewhere. Thank you, and appreciate your work. You, Mr. Chairman, I'd ask unanimous consent. Mr. Chairman, I'd ask unanimous consent that the regs of uh, the Secretary's agency dated March 29th, 2022, be placed in the record in which a quote contained says full 83% of the people who were subject to removal between 2014 and 2019 were referred to an immigration judge and, in fact, were not found to have a credible fear. So when the Secretary said that uh, I was wrong about the majority, he was wrong. It's 83% according to his own documents in the period 2014 to 2019, and perhaps it has improved, but I doubt it. Yield uh, back. Without objection, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana. Secretary Mayorkas, we have the frustrating responsibility on this committee of providing oversight of your agency, but I have to be honest and tell you I'm not sure exactly what you do at the Department of Homeland Security other than great harm. On your watch, the data is pretty clear. We've had record levels of illegal immigration, a rapid decline in deportations, skyrocketing fentanyl deaths across our country, and the Secret Service, which is a DHS component, can't determine who left cocaine at the White House. In the middle of all this, you created the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency, CISA, which is a division of, 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 your, of DHS. 
and it's one of the Biden administration agencies that colluded with and coerced the social media companies to censor Americans' protected free speech online. That's specifically detailed in a 155-page court opinion that came out of the federal court in Louisiana in the landmark litigation of Missouri v. Biden. Have you read that court opinion? Uh, Congressman, uh, I have not, and um, the, uh, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency does not censor speech. Okay, well, that's the court found otherwise, and it's really curious to me. Actually, it's quite alarming that you haven't read the opinion, because your agency is listed in this opinion. The federal court looked at volumes of evidence over months of litigation, and they determined, among other things, that uh, if the allegations made by the plaintiffs, the states in this case are true, and, and hold on, the preliminary injunction was granted against your agency, sir, and other Biden administration agencies, including the DOJ and FBI, the court said it involves the most massive attack against free speech in United States history. And you're telling me this opinion issued July 4th has not reached your desk? No one's briefed you on it? Oh, I have been briefed on the Missouri litigation. Okay, but you haven't taken the time to read it yet. Congressman, um, No, hold on. Have you read it or not? I have read parts of it, Congress. Oh, parts of it. Did you read the parts where it said that this is Orwellian and dystopian and that your agency is involved in a massive cover-up of specifically conservatives free speech online? Congressman, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency is not involved in such conduct. Okay. Well, the court found otherwise, and you stand here under oath and you give us these answers that we know were not true because this is demonstrably untrue. I'm suggesting to you that you're saying things to us under oath that are proven by the record to be untrue. Let me ask you about this specifically. Um, CISA was created to, uh, we call it the Misinformation and Disinformation Subcommittee of CISA. Are you familiar with that? Uh, MDM, the MDM subcommittee, is it, you're familiar with that? Congressman, I am very well aware of the threat of disinformation emanating from adverse nations. Are you states. familiar with the subcommittee? Just answer the question. I am. Okay, does it still exist? Congressman, are you speaking of the... Does the MDM subcommittee still exist? Uh, I would have to get back to you on that. Okay. All right. Kind of a big deal in your agency. I'm sh uh, kind of shocked that you don't know the answer to that. Can you define what misinformation is? Congressman, um, misinformation is false information that is disseminated uh, to... Uh, Excellent. Who determines what is false? Uh, Congressman, our focus... No. Our who focus determines what is false in your agency? If you're going to pull something off the internet and collude with a social media platform to make sure Americans don't see it, who determines what's false? Congressman, we don't do that. That's not true. That is not true. That is not what the court has found. This is not a Republican talking point. This is what the documents show. We've had people testify under oath that say, and you just define the term, you're telling me that you don't know who determines what is false? Congressman, what we do at CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, is identify the tactics that adverse nation states use to weaponize disinformation. Okay, what is American disinformation? Country. What is disinformation? Disinformation is inaccurate information. Who determines what's inaccurate? Who determines what's false? Do you understand the problem here? The reason the framers of our Constitution did not create an exception for quote-unquote false information from the First Amendment is because they didn't trust the government to determine what it is. And you have whole committees of people in your agency trying to determine what they, de they determine, they define as false or misinformation. That is not true. Well, then what is true? What we Please do enlighten us. Is what we do is we disclose the tactics that adverse nation states are utilizing to weaponize no, sir. information. No, sir. The court found specifically, it's a finding of fact that is not disputed by the government defendants, the Biden administration, your agency, the FBI, or DHS, not in the litigation. They determined you made, you and all of your cohorts made no distinction between domestic speech and foreign speech. So don't stand there and tell me under oath that you only focused on adverse, you know, uh, adversaries around the world, Congress foreign actors. That's not true. Congressman, the, um, the Missouri case, the litigation to which you refer, is the, the subject of continuing litigation. But the facts were not disputed, and I so, so regret that I'm out of time. I hope I get some more yielded. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Georgia. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I don't trust the government of Florida to tell teachers how to teach history, uh, particularly black history, uh, wanting to put a revisionist uh, idea that uh, somehow slaves benefited from being slaves. I don't uh, think that that is the truth. But I'll tell you, my friend uh, Donald Trump will have his folks thinking that that's the truth. Uh, 
But it, at any rate, MAGA Republican extremists want to sell us on an apocalyptic fantasy. They want the American people to believe that the border is out of control, that drugs are flowing in freely, that September 11th style terrorists are infiltrating with impunity, and that Latino immigrants are coming to rape, rob, and murder our families. But in reality, the greatest threat facing our homeland is white nationalist ideology that lies beneath such rhetoric. Experts agree that dangerous speech from elected officials creates a climate that foments violence and threatens public safety. And Republicans in the 118th Congress have amplified the white nationalist invasion conspiracy theory over 80 times in their official capacity. 11 members of this very committee peddled this dangerous anti-Semitic racist conspiracy theory. As Dr. Heidi Byrick, co-founder of the Global Project Against Hate and Extremism, has said, quote, when migrants are described as invaders, that leads to violence. Because how else does one stop an invasion, end quote. Mr. Secretary, as the ranking member mentioned, next month is the anniversary of the El Paso shooting. The shooter was inspired by white nationalist theories like the Great Replacement Theory and claimed that there was a Hispanic, quote, invasion. He drove hundreds of miles to, as he admitted, target Hispanics and to murder 23 people. He is far from the only person inspired to kill as a result of these theories. In October of 2018, a domestic terrorist infiltrated the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and murdered 11 congregants during Shabbat services. That man targeted Jewish, he targeted a Jewish community because he believed in the Great Replacement Theory. And unfortunately, this has become a repeated pattern, which includes the attack in Poway and Buffalo. Regardless of political views, we should all stand for the principle that hate is unacceptable. Mr. Secretary, what kind of impact does this white nationalist rhetoric of invasion or replacement have on minority communities? Uh, Congressman, uh, when an act of hate uh, occurs, it's not just uh, the community that is impacted. The, the adverse impact is felt across uh, this nation. Uh, one of the most prominent terrorism-related threats that we face in the homeland is what we term domestic violent extremism. It is... And it's white Ill nationalist extremism, is it not? Um, uh, Congressman, uh, there are diverse ideologies that underlie the acts of violence. White nationalism is one of them, but we do not focus on the ideology itself. We focus on its connectivity to violence and our effort to prevent that violence. We see a d diverse range of ideologies of hate, anti-government sentiment, personal grievances, false narratives, fuel acts of violence in this country. It is the connectivity to violence. Well, when elected officials repeat great replacement rhetoric, including the language of invasion, are they putting a target on the backs of immigrants and people of color? It certainly fuels um, uh, the threat landscape uh, that we encounter. In these and, and what kind of dangers does this rhetoric impose on law enforcement? We have seen uh, the number of ambushes of law enforcement officers increase year over year recently, and I could provide uh, that data to you. Thank you. Uh, my time is about to expire, and I'll yield it back. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary, who must take responsibility for the creation of the Disinformation Governance Board? You as the Secretary of Homeland Security or President Biden? Uh, Congressman, the, um, the Disinformation Governance Board, which has been mischaracterized so, so who's, is, did President Biden tell you to do it, or did you guys decide to do it? Did you take responsibility for creating that? 
Congressman, it is my responsibility, and I will Very share good. with you that. So the last four days, 5,300 people have been encountered in the Tucson sector. The last four days, 5,300. In the last week, over 9,000 in the Tucson sector. That's not my made-up numbers. That's from, from uh, Sector Chief Modlin. Who must bear responsibility for that, you or President Biden? Congressman, our approach. Is it you or President Biden? Who made the policies that, that let's get there? Did President Biden tell you to, to open up the border, or did you? The border is not open, Congressman. Oh, so that's why there's 5,300 in the last four days that illegally tried to enter the country. Congressman. And that doesn't include the Godaways in that sector, which is the number one sector, three to one. And you're saying it's somebody else's fault, it's not open. Well, let's talk about this then. Um, recently retired CBP Chief Raul Ortiz has testified under oath that the U.S. does not have operational control of the border as required. Is it your responsibility or President Biden's responsibility to make sure there is operational control? Congressman, um, these are not hard questions. It's either your responsibility or President Biden's. Whose is it? Congressman, the men and women of the Department of Homeland Security work tirelessly. So, so look, I'm going to tell you, I get down to the border. I love the CBP agents. You know what they keep saying? We just want to enforce the law. So who's preventing from, from enforcing the law? Is it you or President Biden? It's that, that, it's that simple because your policies are allowing millions of people to get through uh, across this border. So since January 20th, 2021, millions of illegal aliens have crossed the southern border and have been released by DHS into the interior of the U.S. Did you implement this catch and release program or was it President Biden? Congressman, individuals... Uh, who pose a public so uh, look look you know you and i've had this song and dance before you never want to answer the question you never want to answer the question look there's a whole side over there they want to feed you pablum so you can say whatever you want but i think the american people know it's either you or president biden and i want to know does president biden giving the directions on the implementation of your policies or are you the one that's creating it? So let's go to some of the stuff that you've written. In September 30th, 2021, you issued guidance that we had a senior DHS official come and tell this committee that your guidance from September 30th, 2021, led to ICE officers not submitting, quote, through their chain of command as many cases as they would have submitted previously, close quote. It was under your name. Did President Biden tell you to write that memo, or is that your policy? Congressman, the, the memo that you referred to is the Enforcement Priorities Memo. Did you, priorities did you is that, that yours? Is that your policy then, or is that President Biden's? The priorities that we established in that memo. I'll take it that it must be yours. I, I, guess, I guess that's all we can take then. Okay, so since we've been sitting here since 10 a.m., that's the number of drug overdoses due to fentanyl in the country. So my question for you is, who's responsible? Is it Joe Biden as president of the United States, or is it you as Secretary of Homeland Security for the open border where fentanyl's coming across and we have American citizens dying? That's since 10 a.m. Eastern time. Congressman, the border is not open. The challenge of fentanyl is one that has been escalating for more than look, five look, look, years. Look, look, let's just, you cited a figure that was 50,000, and since you came in, it's been more than double every year. Who's responsible for that? Is it you and your policies, or is it President Biden? It's a simple thing. You don't want to answer it because you know it's you. You know it's your policies you're driving in. On October 27, 2021, you issued guidance that restricted the ability of ICE officers to arrest aliens in protected areas such as courthouses where they knew aliens to be. You thus made it more difficult and dangerous for ICE officers to go and enforce the law. These are people who had already had, and generally, um, many of them had already had their, their day in court. Did President Biden order you to issue that guidance? Congressman, our policies are driven to protect the American people. Who, safeguard. who issued that policy? Was it the president? Are you, were you following the president, or did you create the policy? Congressman, that, Or will you ever give us an answer? That is a policy. Yield back. Disgusting. Mr. Chairman, Gentleman from I have a unanimous consent to enter into the record. Uh, data, excuse, thank you. Uh, data from the U.S. Sentencing Commission, which shows that 88% of the people convicted for fentanyl trafficking crimes 
are United States citizens, not uh, immigrants crossing the border. Without objection. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California. Mr. Secretary, um, welcome to the committee. It's wonderful to see you. Um, you and I served together in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Los Angeles now some 30 years ago. I had great uh, admiration and respect for your integrity and your work ethic then, and I do today. And uh, I'm grateful for you taking on what may be the most difficult job uh, in the U.S. government today. Uh, so thank you for being here. Uh, my colleagues have a lot of questions for you, but they don't seem to want to give you the time to answer them. Uh, I'd like to ask you about the Cyber Information, Cybersecurity and, Inf and Infrastructure Security Agency. Uh, in 2016, the, the Russians intervened heavily in our election uh, to try to elect Donald Trump. Uh, they intervened with a massive social media campaign run out of St. Petersburg. Uh, they intervened by hacking uh, the Democratic Party uh, and its emails and releasing them through cutouts. In 2020, uh, the Cybersecurity Agency, having learned uh, from the experience in 2016, I think did an admirable, admirable job in protecting our elections infrastructure. Its primary sin, although the Republicans won't say it, is that its then director um, asserted after the election that it was the most secure election in our history. That was the sin of the agency, doing its job and doing it well. Um, as we look forward to the next presidential election, I want to ask you about what you see as the threats uh, to our election's infrastructure or the threats of misinformation, disinformation from whatever, other, whatever source. Um, I'm particularly concerned about YouTube's recent decision. I think, you know, the Republican badgering has had an effect, and this is part of the effect. YouTube recently decided to, quote, stop removing content that advances false claims that widespread fraud, errors, or glitches occurred in the 2020 and other past U.S. presidential elections. So YouTube has now decided it's not going to remove content it knows to be false. Um, other social media platform, platforms like Twitter have decided to fire uh, those that would be in the business of security or looking for misinformation, disinformation campaigns from whatever sources. So in light of that changed environment, um, what do you see as the principal threats to our elections uh, in 2024? Congressman, I would um, uh, identify at least three threat streams. One is the threat of disinformation um, propagated by uh, the nation states of Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. Two would be the cybersecurity uh, threat, something that we are always vigilant in guarding against. And it is because of that threat that we seek to build redundancies in our election systems to best protect them. And third is something that we saw manifested um, uh, last year, and that is the threat of physical intimidation of individuals at the voting booth. Uh, those are three threat streams that uh, I can identify right off the bat. We are very focused on each of them. Of course, the physical security is not something that we ourselves uh, provide, but work uh, in collaboration with local jurisdictions and give them uh, advice as to how they can best secure the facility and the integrity of the voting process. Uh, today you may have seen it was reported that uh, Rudy Giuliani has acknowledged in a court filing uh, that the statements he was making about these Georgia election workers were just patently false. Um, those election workers' lives were put at great, great risk. Uh, some of your own personnel, uh, their lives have been put at great risk. Um, uh, by those who would attack our elections or attack efforts to prevent misinformation and disinformation. Uh, what efforts can you make to protect election workers uh, and your own staff uh, from uh, these relentless falsehoods uh, advanced uh, to facilitate uh, the campaigns of uh, some of my colleagues' uh, presidential hopeful? Some of the things that we do, um, Congressman, is uh, we provide information to state, local, tribal, territorial, and campus law enforcement with respect to the threat streams that we uh, are observing. We also have protective security advisors in each state that give advice uh, to local communities about how best to secure facilities and make them safe areas for people to vote. Those are two uh, examples of the work that we perform. Well, I appreciate uh, what you do, Mr. Secretary, and I hope that these uh, constant and unfounded attacks 
on you, on your agency, on the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. Uh, don't make your work that much more difficult. Uh, we're grateful to you, and with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Wisconsin is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to issue a quick correction here. As we start, it was mentioned earlier that Congress has not acted in decades in regards to um, securing the border. Um, this House of Representatives and this session of Congress did act. We passed H.R. 2 to secure the border. How many Afghans, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Secretary, have been admitted to the United States through parole since the fall of Kabul? Two years ago. Uh, Congressman, I'd, I would be pleased to provide you with that data. I don't have it. Uh, there were 70,192 Afghans that were brought into the United States. They were um, brought here on parole for two years. Will you be reviewing each individual status on a case-by-case -case basis as this expiration happens? Uh, Congressman, um, you're referring to what we termed Operation Allies Welcome a program that we are very proud of, that we instituted to provide refuge for individuals, many of whom- Will you be reviewing those on, they came in on parole, will you be reviewing them on a case-by-case -case basis? We reviewed them on a case-by-case -case basis, and when those parole periods are subject to renewal, we will do so. The again. commander down at Fort McCoy in my state, when I interviewed him two years ago, he said they were not interviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. In fact, in the terror hotbed of the world, Afghanistan, which should have a special immigrant visa process, previous administration used that to make sure to fully vet, not one of those, ref uh, one of those people that came in from Afghanistan were sent through the special immigrant visa process. They were simply given parole. Do you know how much damage was done to Fort McCoy during that period when those 12,000 plus um, Afghans came in? Congressman, the individuals who were benefited from Operation Allies Welcome were indeed screened and vetted uh, by uh, government personnel. Uh, they were brought in categorical parole, Mr. Chairman. There was $145.6 million of damage that was done to Fort McCoy. Did you realize that? Congressman, uh, we're the very The place proud. was virtually destroyed. I want to move on a poster behind me. We are seeing all sorts of very serious, very serious criminal threats that come from across the border. That was two weeks ago from FBI Director Ray. In other words, saying the border is out of control. You say it's under control. Who's lying, you or FBI Director Ray? Congressman, uh, we are very proud of our efforts to secure the border. We are relentless in our efforts to strengthen. FBI Director Ray said it's becoming more and more of a priority for us under oath just two weeks ago. Who's lying to us, Director Ray or you? Congressman, we work very closely with the FBI to ensure the safety and security of the American people. That is our highest priority. Till Ill, to illegal border crossings. Do you agree the increased fentanyl is not tied till Ill, to illegal border crossings? Do you agree with that statement? No. It's not effectively managed right now. And until it is, the cartels are the, they're, they're the winners of this. Cartels are the winners. Sheriff Mark Daniels, under questioning here a few months ago um, before this committee, um, Cochise County down on the border of Arizona, he said the open border has led to a significant increase in the amount of fentanyl coming into this country. Do you agree with his assessment? Congressman, we have taken it to the cartel. Do you agree with his assessment? He said the amount of fentanyl has went up significantly as a result of the open borders policy implemented by this administration January 20th of 2021. Is he, is he lying to us? Did Sheriff Daniels lie to us? Congressman, I respectfully disagree with Sheriff Daniels, whom I know well. So I Sheriff Daniels is lying to us? That is not what I said, Congressman, and let me Someone's not you. telling the truth here, Mr. Secretary. Someone's not telling the truth. It's either Daniels or it's you. Congressman, we have interdicted more fentanyl at the ports of entry than in the prior administration. Mr. Chairman, I'll go to close here. The most urgent lethal threat in America was in this man's testimony. There's one person in America who can reduce the number of fentanyl deaths in America. 
And by the way, the term fentanyl overdoses is used. That's not the case anymore, is it? It's fentanyl poisonings. We've had them here, the Rackwall family from my state of Wisconsin. When you hear of fentanyl poisonings here in America, there's one person that can do something about it, and he sits right before us today. You, sir, are responsible for reducing fentanyl deaths in America. Will you ever do anything about it? I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Chairman, I got a unanimous consent request. Quickly. Gentleman from Louisiana. Uh, two things, actually. I uh, wanted to enter into the record a report, a Fox News report, April 27, 2022, which details the testimony of Mr. Mayorkas. They created the disinformation governance board within DHS to combat alleged disinformation and misinformation terms that he's not able to explain here. And the second document uh, is the public statement on the Hunter Biden emails with the 51 former intel agents um, that has now been debunked, but they also refer to misinformation. So it's an important term. Enter those into the record. Without objection, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from California. Thank you, Chairman Jordan. The House Judiciary Committee is responsible for helping to ensure the rule of law. Unfortunately, the chair of this committee ignored a bipartisan congressional subpoena. The actions of the chair have undermined the credibility of all congressional committees in seeking information from witnesses and damage the rule of law. Now, Secretary Mayorkas, thank you for your public service. I'd like to discuss with you the history of the southern border. In September 1969, a few years before Watergate consumed this presidential administration, the president launched Operation Intercept, which basically shut down the southern border. Less than three weeks later, that operation was stopped because it largely failed to address the issues at the border. Secretary so, Mayorkas, who was the Republican president in 1969? Congressman, I have to uh, think back sequentially um, in reverse chronology, but I'm sure you know the answer you immediately. I'll give you a hint. This Republican president resigned. Uh, Congressman, uh, I, I know the president, uh, uh, President Nixon. Thank you. After Nixon resigned in 1974, his vice president became president. But the issues at the border continued, and in 1976, the president stated, quote, 80 to 90 percent of the heroin that comes in the United States today comes across from our southern border, end quote. Secretary Mayorkas, who was the Republican president in 1976? The vice president to Nixon. I'm sorry? He was the vice president to Richard Nixon. Um, Gerald Ford, are you yes, speaking Yes, that's up? correct. Yeah, and I, then, I, and then I'd prefer not to answer it. Questions of history right now, my focus is right. on the work I'm gonna, I'm gonna help you with Homeland it. Security. I'm going to help you with this. In the 1980s, the Republican president had promised mourning in America again. But the issues at the southern border continued, prompting him to order a partial shutdown of the border in 1985. This operation, aptly named Operation Intercept II, was stopped after only a few days because it also failed to address the issues at the border. And this was a president that knew about these issues because he was a former governor of California. Secretary Mayorkas, who was the Republican president in 1985? Ronald Reagan, Thank you. The border issues continued into this century. In 2006, the president, who was also familiar with the border because he was a former governor of Texas, declared that, quote, for decades, the United States has not been in complete control of its borders, end quote. Secretary Mayorkas, who was the Republican president in 2006? President Bush, okay. Congressman. In the prior administration, the Republican president tried to solve their issues at the border, and he failed. I would not like to show a video of what was actually happening during the prior administration in 2018. This you can play is the video. a pit stop on a punishing journey to the U.S. border, and it's still just the beginning. Migrants from Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador continue to make their way north, fleeing poverty, persecution, and gang violence. The caravan now includes an estimated 7,200 migrants, and more are expected to join tomorrow, potentially pushing the number past 10,000. In May 2019, the situation got even worse. Politico published an article on June 5, 2019, that was titled, Border arrests rose to nearly 132,000 in May as the border surge continues. 
City of Mallorcas, who was the Republican president in 2018 and 2019? President Trump, Congressman. And now we're here in 2023. City of Mallorcas, last month in June, border crossings declined to the lowest level in over two years, correct? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Border the... crossings last month declined to the lowest level in over two years, correct? Yes. Okay. Politico published an article last week that stated approximately 99,545 individuals were apprehended last month, the first time the figure dropped below 100,000 in more than two years. That data is largely correct, right? I, I believe so, yes. All right, so based on the facts that you testified to, here is this chart. It shows that under Trump, there were 133,000 border apprehensions in May 2019, and last month, under the Biden administration, there were less than 100,000 border apprehensions. The facts show the southern border is doing better last month than it was under Trump in May 2019. Thank you, Secretary Mayorkas, for your public service. And now the Republicans want to impeach you. Good luck with that one. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. I thank the chairman. Secretary Mayorkas, on April 28th, 2022, I ask you, quote, will you testify under oath right now do we have operational control, yes or no, end quote. You responded with, quote, yes, we do, period, end quote. I then asked, we have operational control of the borders? You responded, quote, yes, we do, period, end quote. Followed up, I said, I read to you the definition of operational control. I actually held up this chart. Operational control, as defined under the Secure Fence Act. Put it up for plain reading, plain as day. I put up the second part of the same statute, which defines operational control. It means the prevention of all unlawful entries in the United States, including entries by terrorists, other unlawful aliens, instruments of terrorism, narcotics, and other contraband. I said to you, do you stand by in your testimony that we have operational control in light of this definition? You responded with, quote, I do, period, end quote. Earlier, you testified I didn't give you a chance to finish. Yet, you specifically, when asked and held up a statute defining exactly what operational control meant under the Secure Fence Act, you said, quote, I do. I believe that was purposeful. I believe you want the American people to believe we have operational control of the border when we very clearly do not. Less than a month later, in Homeland Security, you testified, quote, under that strict definition, this country has never had operational control. This year, Homeland, House Homeland Security, then Border Patrol Chief Raul Ortiz testified before the Homeland Committee that DHS did not have operational control of the border, either by the statutory definition or not. Now that is an honest answer. In the Senate Judiciary Committee, shortly thereafter, you testified with respect to the definition of operational control, I do not use the definition that appears in the Secure Fence Act. And the Secure Fence Act provides statutorily that operational control is defined as preventing all unlawful entries in the United States, and by that definition, no administration has ever had operational control. If you will recall when you testified here in front of me when I asked that question, when you very clearly stated we do have operational control. When presented with the actual definition of operational control, you didn't hesitate, you said, I do, and you in fact then referred back and said, I believe that my predecessors would have said the same thing. I asked Chad Wolf that question in this room, and Chad said, well, no, we didn't use that framing to say we have operational control. We're striving to achieve operational control, but you didn't do that. You look straight at the American people, straight at me, straight at every, every person on this committee, and said, we have operational control. Why? Congressman, two points. One, you did not let me complete my answer. Two. Oh, hold on. That, or, give me your second point. Go ahead. Thank you. Two, two, the Secure Fence Act defines operational control as not a single individual 
crosses the border. I'm aware. I read it, and I read it to you, and you read it, and in fact, you said, I do. You didn't hesitate. You didn't say, I do. I need, I need to explain what I mean by I do. You said, I do, over and over again, and here's the problem with that. This is a pattern. Did you lie another time when you said on September 24, 2021, at a press conference, quote, we know that those images painfully conjured up the worst elements of our nation's ongoing battle against systemic racism when responding to the alleged whipping incident by the Border Patrol agents who report to you, when in fact, on October 22, 2022, it was reported that two and a half hours before that press conference, Marcia Espinoza, Assistant Secretary of DHS Public Affairs, emailed you and CC'd other DHS leadership, alerting you all that the photographer who took the images did not see any whipping occur, invalidating the initial claim. And it wasn't until May of this year that you corrected the record to say, well, let me just correct you right there because actually the investigation concluded the whipping did not occur. Don Rosenberg, in this very room, testified it a few weeks ago that you lied. It is a perpetual pattern, and the fact is, there are real people that are impacted by that. We have now had, since you testified, we have had something like 200 people a day dying from fentanyl deaths, which would amount to 90,000 people. I showed you before, when you were here, the lost voices of fentanyl, the hundreds, the thousands of Americans that continue to die, 90,000 since you came into this committee and lied to us saying we have operational control. I yield back. Gentleman yield, excuse me, gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Secretary, you have a serious job, and occasionally you have to deal with some very unserious MAGA colleagues of mine. Your serious job is to secure the border of the greatest country in the world, a country that is neighbor to some of the most violent and economically insecure countries in the world where people are willing to risk everything to come here. And somehow, you have to secure the border, but also make sure we're not pushing little girls back into the river so they can drown. It's a hard job. If it was an easy job, we wouldn't have asked you to do it. But you were asked to do it because you're qualified, you're competent, you care, you show compassion, and you show up every day, and you deal with this. Frankly, sir, I think sometimes you're too nice because if I had a chairman who failed to honor his own lawful subpoena about 500 days after it was submitted to him, I would say, catch me when you're serious. Come talk to me when you're going to follow the law about whether you think I follow the law. But that's not how you are. You take your job seriously, even in front of a lot of unserious people. In fact, the chair that you were sitting in you may not know this, but the last person who sat in that chair was called by the chairman an anti-vaccine, anti-Semitic witness in RFK Jr. So you have brought immediate credibility to the chair that you're sitting in by just being here. They're not serious people. They chide people for their pronouns. They obsess and display in this committee and other committees a private citizen's non-consensual nude images. We're not talking about serious people. We're not talking about people who are on the level. And so what do we want to do? We want to acknowledge the seriousness of your job and hopefully one day in the majority give you the tools to deliver on what we believe ultimately can put us in the most secure place, which is comprehensive immigration reform. And in the spirit of that, I want to ask you, because I believe in that and my colleagues believe in that, in January, DHS established a new set of processes for lawful entry of Cubans, Haitians, Nicaraguans, and Venezuelans that drastically reduced encounters of those nationals at the southern border. This freed up department resources to combat drug trafficking and other cartel crimes. Democrats applauded the measure, while Republicans scrambled to find a new way to turn it into campaign fundraising emails. Last Congress, Democrats proposed increases to funding for CBP personnel to patrol the southern border and investments in technology to interdict smuggling through ports of entry. Again, my Republican colleagues failed to support common sense measures to secure the homeland. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle, they don't have solutions, they want the chaos. So Mr. Secretary, they have put forth proposals to defund the CBP-1 app, which has helped alleviate strained manpower at the southern border. What impact would that have on our homeland security? 
Congressman, the CBP-1 app is one element of our approach of building and expanding lawful pathways for people to reach the United States in a safe, orderly, and lawful way, as well as delivering consequences at the border for those individuals who do not use them. The CBP-1 app, number one, reduces the number of irregular encounters at our southern border. Number two, and critically, cuts out the smuggling organizations that um, impose such tragedy and trauma on vulnerable individuals purely for the sake of profit. And three, allows us to screen and vet individuals before they arrive at our border. It is of tremendous utility to us, and its results have proven productive. And thank you, Mr. Secretary. As I said, you have a serious job. Border crossings are down, despite my MAGA co colleagues constantly saying we have an open border, which only invites people south of the border to believe that they should try and come here. They're rooting for that chaos. You are trying to bring solutions to stop that. Fentanyl seizures are up. Congratulations to the brave men and women who wear the badge every day and walk the beat at CBP. That should be celebrated, but rather it's used by my MAGA colleagues uh, as a political weapon to suggest that they would rather the fentanyl get past CB3, past the ports of entry, and into our schools and our communities. You've got a tough job, you're a serious person, and we're grateful that you're doing it. And I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized. I thank the chairman. Um, Secretary Mayorkas, the Department of Homeland Security issued a National Terrorism Advisory System Bulletin this year in February. It said the United States remains in a heightened threat environment fueled by several factors, including online environment filled with false or misleading narratives and conspiracy theories, and other forms of mis, dis, and malinformation. Can you define malinformation for us? Uh, Congressman, uh, we're dealing with false information that is uh, used for a particular purpose. Isn't malinformation actually true information that may be inconvenient to the establishment orthodoxy? I'm, I'm sorry, Congressman. Isn't malinformation a made-up word that refers to information that's actually true but just inconvenient to the government narrative? Uh, that, is, that is not true, Congressman. Let me, let me ask you this. Uh, you said that the proliferation of false or misleading narratives so discord and undermine public trust in U.S. government institutions. Uh, is it illegal to undermine public trust in U.S. government institutions? Congressman, we become involved as we believe in the First Amendment right, and we have safeguards to protect it. We actually have a statutorily created Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. We become involved not with respect to a particular ideology. We are ideology neutral, but it's the connectivity to violence. Isn't larger we, government an ideology, the bigger government? Is it, let me ask you my original question, is it illegal to undermine public trust in U.S. government institutions? Congressman, we understand First Amendment principles. We embrace and protect them. Doesn't Individuals the can espouse whatever ideology they believe in. And so that it's, is a, that so is let a, me ask you the question, if you just a answer it directly, is it illegal to undermine public trust in U.S. government institutions? Isn't that, in fact, what we're doing here today? When we point out that you've released a million or two million people into this country without trying to deport them? Yeah. I mean, are, are we, in fact, undermining trust in, US, in your institution? Aren't we doing that? And is, isn't that actually healthy when we point that out? Congressman, may I share with you what the Department of Homeland Security does with respect to ideologies? I want to, I need to what ask you another question since you haven't answered any of these yet. The, you, you say that um, there is widespread online proliferation of false or misleading narratives regarding COVID-19. Is the claim that natural immunity is real, is that a false or misleading online narrative? Congressman, we do not evaluate particular ideologies or particular narratives. How, Our focus how about the claim that vaccines don't stop the spread of the virus? Was that a false or misleading COVID narrative? Congressman, what we do is we are involved when there's a connectivity between an ideology, whatever that ideology. How about, I'm not talking about ideology, I'm talking about COVID-19. Is, is the uh, notion that masks were ineffective at stopping transmission, was that a false or misleading narrative? 
Congressman, allow me to repeat. What we get engaged in is a connectivity to violence. It is our responsibility to prevent violence from occurring. We work very closely. Is it? All right, I'm just saying, I want you to give me an example of a false or misleading narrative that encouraged violence. That you, you say that there were, that grievances associated with these themes inspired violent extremist attacks during 2021. Did hydroxychloroquine, was, did that inspire violent extremist attacks? What are you talking about in this document when you say that false or misleading narratives about COVID-19 inspired violent extremist attacks during 2021? Can you give us a single example? I've given you some questions. Was it the, was it the narrative that this may have leaked from a lab in China? Was that the thing? And, and if so, what did it inspire? What's the violence? Congressman, would you like an example? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, COVID-19 is caused by 5G cell towers, an attack on a, on a cell tower. That attack on a cell tower triggers the involvement of the Department of Homeland Security. That is an example. It is the connectivity to violence. We do not so condone you think, you violence. You think COVID-19 caused attacks on cell towers? I Congress think you're chasing a, ridiculous Congress things. Mr. Chairman. People watching this at home, Mr. Chairman, they've got to be just amazed that you would, you would espouse Chairman, this. Can the witness be allowed to answer? No, he, is, he is not. He said that false or misleading narratives about COVID-19 need to be censored. He's implying that they need to be censored because getting out this information, the free speech, is somehow dangerous to our country. Mr. Chairman, he didn't say that. In the context that. of COVID-19, I completely I, disagree. He didn't give us an example. Chairman, can he answer? And I yield back the balance. Can, can he answer the question, the question because the question. his theme is quoted? The time, the time belongs to the gentleman. He has yielded back. The time now goes to, and before I yield to the gentleman from Washington, I'm sure she'll be willing to yield to you, Mr. Secretary. We've, we've been going almost two hours. And if you need a break, just let us know. But we'll, we'll keep going. I'll yield to the gentlelady for her, for her five minutes. And if you want to respond to Mr. Massey in that five, you can go right ahead. The lady from Washington is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, thank you for coming here today. I'm going to give you a, a brief opportunity, because I have a full five minutes, uh, but a brief opportunity to respond to the gentleman. I, I don't even know where to begin with the grotesque distortion of information. I just don't even know where to begin. Mr. Secretary, I want to thank you for your service, for your leadership. I'm sorry what you're, for what you're experiencing today. Um, and as the ranking member of the Immigration Subcommittee, I want to take a step back and just remind everyone of the mess that you inherited from the previous administration and the steps that your department under your leadership is taking to move us in the right direction. Let's be really clear. The Trump administration considered every undocumented immigrant a priority for removal. The Trump administration separated children from their parents. But perhaps what escaped attention the most was that the Trump administration simply did not believe in legal immigration. The previous administration enacted over 400 changes designed to shut down legal immigration. And the truth is that it's our job in Congress to fix this. We have not updated the immigration system in over three decades. And in that time, America's population has grown by 80 million people. The economy is five times larger. And our inability to modernize American laws, immigration laws, has resulted in record level backlogs for the legal immigration system, making it nearly impossible to come to the United States. A decade ago, the United States Senate passed with 68 bipartisan votes a comprehensive immigration reform bill only to be stymied by Republicans in the House who refused to bring it up for a vote because they knew that it would pass if they did. Today, thanks to a concerted Republican strategy to vilify immigrants, it is hard to imagine a bill like that garnering that kind of bipartisan vote in either chamber. So given that the Republican-controlled House will not move forward meaningful reform, Mr. Secretary, you and the Biden administration have used your legal authorities granted by Congress to add additional legal pathways. And much to some of my colleagues' chagrin, uh, with much success, you are working to provide order and relief to immigrants. The administration announced the opening of regional processing centers across the Western Hemisphere that will allow migrants to have their protection and benefits claims assessed in a humane way without having to make the dangerous journey to the U.S.-Mexico border. 
The administration has embraced the use of parole following a bipartisan tradition of presidential administrations going back 70 years. In addition, the administration also formally announced new family reunification parole processes for El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Colombia. These are modeled after the Cuban family reunification process, which Republicans have supported in the past. And in addition, you've increased the number of appointments that will be available under the CBP. One app, which, while far from perfect, will increase CBP's ability to process more migrants. As you know, Mr. Secretary, I have serious concerns about some policies, including a new asylum regulation, which was just declared unlawful in federal court that I fear undermines due process and right to seek asylum. But despite that, despite that, I am very clear about the Republican opposition to any sensible and humane immigration system and who the good guys are in this situation. That is you, Mr. Secretary. The good guys are you, the Democrats, and this administration who understand the great importance of immigration to America on every level and are determined to take steps to expand pathways for entry and move us forward. And for that, I am tremendously grateful to you, and I thank you for your service and for your leadership. Now, Mr. Secretary, Republicans projected terrible things after Title 42, but in fact, Politico has called it the migrant crisis that still hasn't arrived. And Mr. Chairman, I seek unanimous consent to enter an article into the record with that exact title. Objection. Can you talk about the administration's attempts to expand legal pathways and why you think it is so important? Congresswoman, um, our approach is to expand lawful pathways so that individuals who qualify for relief under the laws of this Congress do not have to place their lives and their life savings in the hands of unscrupulous smugglers who only exploit them for profit. To bring greater security and strength to our border and to allow our agencies to screen and vet individuals before they arrive here in the United States. Those are three very significant benefits of our lawful pathways. I know you and I disagree on the other element of our approach, which is to deliver consequences for those who do not use um, those lawful pathways. I thank you, Mr. Secretary. I hope we always hold up the Constitution, and I thank you for your service. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, he's back. The chair recognizes himself. Mr. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you, you, you know what the number is, don't you? number that Mr. Gates was trying to get an answer, get a response from. You know what that number is, right? Congressman, I would be pleased to provide this committee, you, Mr. No, no, Chairman. You, 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 uh, know, you don't know now? You don't know what that is? I mean, again, just to, just to read, because what Mr. Gates was trying to get at, I think what the country would like to know is we know that there's been an influx of people coming in. Two, over 2 million encounters on our southern border, inadmissible uh, aliens on our southern border. We know that's, that number has come in since Joe Biden's been president. We know it's a big number. And all he was asking was how many of that two point something million, over two million, how many have went through the adjudication process and actually been removed? Mr. Chairman. And you're telling, you're telling the, the Judiciary Committee today you don't know what that number is? Mr. Chairman, what I am sharing with you is that we will provide you with whatever data you request. No, no, that's not what we're, I, I want to go right, but it's a simple, we, we've had kind of two simple questions that you didn't give an answer to, and I just want to know if, Give you a, a second chance here if you'll do it. What is that number? Out of that two point something universe of inadmissible a aliens encountered on our southern border who've come into the country, been released into the country, how many have went through the adjudication process and then been removed? Mr. Chairman, I'd be pleased to provide you with that. Can you guess? Mr. Chairman, it is Can not you right. give an estimate? Mr. Chairman, I will not Why, do so. why will you not give an estimate to the American people? Because they would like to know, because that sort of frames it. Here's what's come in. Here's who you've allowed in since Joe Biden's been president. And here's the ones who've actually been removed. I would say two things, Mr. Chairman. Number one, I will provide that data to you. We will do so. Well, you're not real good at that because no. you've said that other times here and you don't give us the data. I mean, we asked information about, about the, uh, the disinformation governance board and all that gets redacted documents. So you're not real good about that. And it's a simple question and frankly, a question we ask you to be prepared for. We wrote you two letters in the last several weeks to be prepared to answer that kind of question. I think probably that specific question, and you won't give us an answer. Mr. And so th the fact that you won't is bad, and the fact that you don't know is just as bad, because it's, it's the one question the country kind of would like to know, 
What's really happening? When you say all these you know, pathways and things and your border's secure and all the things you say, we'd kind of like to know what's really happened with the two point something million people who've been released into the country since Joe Biden's been president. How many have went through the adjudication process and been removed? So now simple, I have, simple question. So now I have three points. One, we will provide the data to you. God bless Two, you. We have been, been we've been waiting, but God bless you. I hope you do it this time. Two, we have been cooperating with this committee. We have made countless documents and people available to you. We have provided briefings. Yeah. And, and here's what those, by the way, just so you know, I'll let you finish with your third point. Here's what those documents look like. Here's the one you sent to us on when you formed. It's a policy and responsibilities in the department's information manipulation mission. That sounds scary enough. Information manipulation mission. And it's all redacted. And this is, this is the kind of stuff you gave us when we were trying to figure out who was in, responsible for putting together the disinformation governance board that I think my colleague Mr. Johnson was asking. And now we're asking a simple question about a number. And the fact that you won't give it to us or don't know it is, I think, a concern for all of us. I would say both sides, because the Democrats probably want to know too. They probably, that, that's, that's something that should be so obvious and you won't communicate to. Make your third point. M Mr. Chairman, we'll provide that information to every, every member. Will it be like this or will it be a real number? Will it be like that? The third, I'll redact, will it be a real number? Mr. Chairman, the third point I would Let make. me ask you real quick. Can you get that number to us like tomorrow? Or has it got, you got to go back and is it going to take weeks and months and haggling back and forth on all the letters we do? Congress writes letters to agencies and we haggle back and forth all that, that dance we have to do. Or can you just get us the number? Mr. Chairman, we'll provide that data to you as promptly as possible. My third point would be the most fundamental point of all when we speak of immigration. We are dealing with a fundamentally broken system. We have between 11 and 12 okay. million. I, 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 got, I got 50 seconds, so I appreciate that. You, you've said that before, so I got that point. Don't mean to cut you off, but I got to get this. Now, in your testimony, you said you've arrested 14,000 smugglers. Seems like a big number to me. What happened to those guys? Those individuals, Mr. Chairman, uh, are, if the evidence so supports, prosecuted for smuggling. You've referred them to DOJ, you've, turned, you've arrested them, you've given them over to DOJ? What's happened to them? Have they been, have they been indicted, taken to trial, found guilty? Are they in prison somewhere? What's, what's the status? I mean, that is a huge number, 14,000 smugglers. I mean, God bless you for getting them, but I'd like to know what happened to them. I'm very, very pleased to provide that data to you. Let me provide well, some examples. You just told us a couple, couple minutes ago you work closely with the FBI. We'd like that information too. Uh, that's, that's important. Have you arrested any of them multiple times? Uh, Congressman, I'll provide that information for you. You think that's a possibility? Some of those smugglers you've arrested more than once? Oh, Congressman, when I prosecuted immigration crimes in the 1990s, we saw individuals who had uh, repeated violations uh, of criminal laws of the United States and repeated removals from the United States. You think I think prosecuted a, my time is expired. You think a smuggler, title. you catch a, someone smuggling people, smuggling drugs, you wouldn't, that guy would be prosecuted and you'd think you would again know that answer too, but Mr. we Chairman. hope you get those answers to us. I yield now uh, to- Unanimous consent request, oh, okay. Mr. Chairman. General ladies from Washington is recognized for UC. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to uh, ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a New York Times article called Burning Cell Towers Out of Baseless Fear they spread the virus. This is a conspiracy theory linking the spread of the coronavirus to 5G wireless technology that spurred more than 100 incidents in just one month. Objection. The chair Thank now you, Mr. Chairman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and um, Secretary. Welcome. Thank you for your good job. I really believe you have a thankless job, but you've done a hell of a job. When I became ranking member of the Homeland Security Border Subcommittee, I made it my priority to visit every major port of entry on the southern border. I visited, met with men and women in uniform, both blue and green uniforms. I wanted to see what the job was about, what the challenges were. But Mr. Secretary, let's talk refugees. COVID-19 has changed the world. Today, we're probably seeing the biggest movement of refugees in recent history, if not in the history of the world. Title 42, when Title 42 was about to be lifted, everybody was expecting total chaos at the border. A week before that, a few days before that event, I went to San Isidro, 
myself and the border port director visited Mexico. We met with Mexican officials, federal, state, local, as well as Mexican stakeholders interested in making sure everything went well at the border. Can I see that Everybody expected chaos. Title 42 was lifted, no chaos. Everything went unexpectedly well. I think you were the architect of that policy, carrot and sticks. You made sure that people had a pathway, had incentives to come legally, and he also put criminal sanctions on those that would break those laws. And of course, you also worked with some of our partners south of the border to make sure that this job was not just the United States, but that the burden was shared with other people like Mexico, Colombia, and other nations around the world. Mr. Mayorkas, you're doing a good job. So my question to you today is, how can we, U.S. Congress, assist you in doing a better job for the United States? Congressman, uh, thank you. We are taking the actions that we think will strengthen the security of our border, uh, uphold our values as well, uh, to the best of our abilities, operating within a broken immigration system. The most fundamental um, benefit that we could um, receive from Congress is legislative reform. You know, I'd like to broken. see us move to an immigration reform. You were trying to say earlier, we have 12 million undocumented workers working in this country, some having been here for 10, 20, 30 years. No hope of an adjustment of status. We have another 10 million job openings in this country today. Let's quickly, in my last minute or two, talk about fentanyl. It's ruining Main Street back home. Deaths. 80 to 90 percent of the fentanyl comes through our ports of entries. Yet right now, you only have enough funding to maybe inspect 2 percent of the vehicles coming through our ports of entry. Does that sound about right? Congressman, we have uh, harnessed advanced technology, most notably the non-intrusive inspection technology, uh, to be a force multiplier for our personnel. We, we rely on funding from Congress for not only that technology, but also the personnel who operate it, the, the extraordinary people of U.S. Customs and Border Protection, both our Border Patrol agents and our Office of Field Operations personnel, and so, our Mr. Air Secretary, Marine. if we wanted to stop more fentanyl from coming into the country, I'd say you need more personnel, more technology, more of those drug-sniffing dogs that are so effective. You need more funding. We want to go from 2% of inspections to 4 to 6 to 10% of those vehicles being inspected. You need the funds. We, we do, Congressman, and it, it is a two-part challenge. It is addressing the supply, uh, which uh, your question is uh, focused on, of course, and we also have to address the issue of demand in this country. The, the scourge of drugs has been a long, enduring one, I will say. Uh, I've prosecuted many. Um, narcotics trafficking cases in my time as a prosecutor, the toxicity um, of fentanyl is something I've never seen before. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for your good work. We want to partner with you to make sure we protect America from those negative elements coming into this country. Mr. Chair, I yield. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary, let me focus on CISA a moment. Uh, and something very specific. Jen Easterly, the director of CISA, testifying before an appropriations subcommittee here in the House earlier this year, said, quote, we don't flag anything to social media organizations at all. We are focused on building resilience to foreign influence and disinformation, close quote. Is that true or false, that, that CISA does not flag anything to social media organizations at all? I believe that is true, um, Congressman, and um, I will verify that. But I believe that is true. We, we, we do. Do you, you know? Do you know? Are you familiar with Brian Scully? Do you know who that is? I do not, Congressman. He was an. Uh, I think the uh, MDM the person responsible for MDM, as you call it, and he testified about switchboarding 
that uh, CISA was engaged in switchboarding in which, for example, it was essentially an audit official to identify something on social media that they deemed to be disinformation aimed at their jurisdiction. They could forward that to CISA, and CISA would share that with the appropriate social media companies. Now, that was a quote from his testimony. That sounds like flagging to me, flagging to social media companies, and all of his testimony was, was of similar import. How does that reconcile with what you just said, Ms. Easterly, correctly answered before the Appropriations Subcommittee? Congressman, uh, a few points on switchboarding. Number no, 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 no. Would you, would you, would you, yes. uh, would you reconcile those two statements, please? Yes. I, I don't really have enough time to go off on nope. dissertation. Yes, I will. Okay. If you'll allow me. Quickly, thank that you. That practice, my understanding is that that practice was in 2018 and 2020 is no longer employed by CISA. And what it amounted to was serving as an intermediary between election officials and social media companies. We were not making a judgment back then in 2018 when, or 2020. Well, I, I get your point. I get your point. I, and I know you're going to elaborate, and I appreciate that. But I, I think the point you just said, and I'd like to inquire further about it, you said it is no longer the practice. When did it stop? I'd be pleased to, um, uh, to provide that information to you, and I will defer to the director uh, easterly, but we will provide that information to you. Uh, you do not know when they stopped doing it? I do not. Um, you have said uh, in your testimony here today several times that we are taking it to the cartels to an unprecedented degree, dismantling those criminal organizations. Those are two things you said. Have Mexican drug cartels become stronger or weaker during your tenure as secretary? Congressman, we are taking it to the cartels to an unprecedented You, you already said that. In fact, I just repeated it to you. Have they become stronger or weaker on your watch? Congressman, the cartels have been a challenge for not only this country, but many Are countries Are you not able to say world. whether they're stronger or weaker on your watch? We, through our efforts, our efforts have weakened those cartels by the investigations and prosecutions that we have conducted with our international The cartels partners. are weakened under your tenure? When is that we, what your testimony is, sir? When we disrupt a cartel, when we arrest an individual with our partners, we have weakened them. That is what the men and women of the Department much, of Homeland Security are dedicated to doing. How much revenue have the cartels received during your tenure? Congressman, I don't have that data. Do you have any, you have no estimate about that whatsoever? That the you cartels, bear in your mind what revenues cartel, Mexican drug cartels have, have received during your tenure as secretary? Congressman, the cartels are very profitable. They were very profitable three years ago, and they were very profitable six years ago. Are they making more or less revenue under your tenure now than under previous administrations? And I will tell you this, that we are unrelenting in more our or, I, I understand your efforts, sir. What I'm talking about are your results. Are they making more or less revenue under your tenure than your predecessors? We have arrested more criminals involved in cartel activity than in the prior. Do you not years. know whether they're making more revenue, or are you simply evading my question? Uh, Congressman, I, I believe I answered your question that I do not have that data. <laughs> are but drug deaths due to penetrating the southern border of the United States increased or reduced during your 30-month tenure over prior periods? The cartels outside of the United States have also stretched their jurisdiction to other countries around the world. How does your record on achieving operational control compare to other administrations? Worse than any other? Uh, no, Congressman. The approach that we are taking, expanding lawful pathways. You've had larger numbers of entries in violation of that of statutory dis of uh, definition, have you not, sir? Congressman, the approach that we are taking of expanding lawful pathways and delivering consequences for those who do not use them are proving results. It continues to be a challenge, as the border has been in the absence of legislative action, but we are achieving results. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Secretary, we'll go a few more rounds, if that's all right, and then we'll, then you, we'll get a break. Uh, Chairman, I have a unanimous consent. Unanimous consent question. from the gentleman from Florida. Yes, from Reuters, U.S. suspends asylum appointments in Texas border city after extortion reports. From U.S. News and World Report, U.S. halts 
online asylum appointments at Texas Crossing after extortion warnings, and the Associated Press, U.S. halts appointments using migrant phone app at Texas Border Crossing seems to be in direct contradiction to the Secretary's testimony. I seek unanimous consent to enter it. Without objection, <clears throat> the Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Mayorkas, for being here. As you well know, immigration and border security are complicated issues that require comprehensive solutions to address national security, humanitarian concerns, workforce issues, gun and drug smuggling in both directions, and fidelity to the rule of law, which is, of course, the foundation of our country. Um, our colleagues across the aisle have made clear with their tone and questions today that their primary interest is in scapegoating you and the Biden administration for the consequences of Congress failing for decades to address either the root causes of immigration at our southern border, including climate change, corruption, and poverty, or the underfunding and all but complete collapse of the U.S. immigration system, which hasn't been updated for decades to respond to current conditions. Instead of investigating and proposing real solutions to these immigration issues, our colleagues prefer to push and sometimes create apocalyptic scenarios to scare Americans and sow chaos, anger, and fear with heated rhetoric and political theater designed to cast blame rather than solve problems. So this is an allegedly an oversight hearing, and um, there's an issue I would like to address. But first, I appreciate your clarity and your nuance, even when responding to some of the more outrageous rhetoric from our colleagues. Can we just clarify one more time in case it's gotten lost? Have you or the Biden administration ever tried to adopt an open border policy? No, we're not. Okay, I didn't think so, Mr. but I just wanted to make sure we were clear there. Um, in the interest of conducting actual oversight and finding solutions, I'd like to turn your attention to an issue that I've been following since I first participated in a multi-year ABA investigation on the topic almost 20 years ago, and that's access to counsel by immigrants um, when they are seeking legal entry into our country. It's critical to ensuring the fidelity of our country to the rule of law, as well as improving functioning of the asylum system. Studies have consistently shown that access to counsel is critical to successfully navigating our laws, um, but those seeking asylum are often unable to access counsel, even if they can afford a lawyer, or volunteers are willing to take their cases. And uh, this past spring, when your agency launched expedited asylum screenings at border patrol facilities, a commitment was made to provide access to such counsel to all immigrants. But according to recent reporting by advocates, that promise has remained unfulfilled. Of the thousands of migrants screened at these facilities, only a small number have been able to consult, however unpredictably, with attorneys by phone, and even fewer have been able to complete formal legal representation. So I know that the failure to ensure uniform or consistent access to counsel when available is not a new issue, but the problem appears to be worsening despite commitments to do better. So moving forward, is your agency able to better guarantee attorney access for asylum seekers screened at Border Patrol facilities or held in detention facilities? Congresswoman, um, uh, when we built uh, this uh, approach, of lawful pathways and the delivery of consequences. One element of it mm -hmm. was uh, the screening of individuals in Border Patrol facilities. And a sub-element of that effort was, in fact, to safeguard access to counsel. Um, I have visited the border um, approximately 20 times. In my last visit, I saw the, the consultation booths that we developed, we built, in a Border Patrol processing facility deliberately to provide that access to counsel. I am aware of the concerns that some have raised with respect to our success in ensuring access to counsel, and we re are reviewing those uh, concerns. I, I appreciate that, and I echo um, Mr. Correa's um, offer to please <clears throat> let us know how we can assist you in uh, making sure that your efforts are more effective and, and what we as Congress need to do um, at this belated time uh, to help address the issue at the southern border. Um, Mr. Chair, I would request unanimous consent to insert into the record an article from the New York Times titled, Lawyers Say Helping Asylum Seekers in Border Custody is Near Impossible. Objection. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gooden. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Countless NGOs, non-government organizations, provide ways and means to illegal immigrants to cross the border and stay here indefinitely. Some of the ones uh, that we are most familiar with, uh, because they're the biggest and have the largest presence, are Jewish Family Services, Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services, and Catholic Charities. Secretary, you've often spoken about your partnership with these NGOs, uh, but many of these are actively encouraging and enticing poor illegal immigrants to cross our borders with the promise of assistance. They promise to provide financial, logistical, and transportation assistance in the form of money, food, and lodging, and transportation to anywhere in the country. I've seen this with my own eyes. I've been uh, to these organizations' facilities in our borders, and they are welcoming folks and sending out the message uh, that the border is open and that we'll provide assistance. Uh, their help comes even with legal guidance and cheat sheets uh, for what to do when they get to wherever it is they'd like a free plane ticket to. My question to you, um, since they seem to not be interested in respecting our laws, are, are you aware of who's funding them? Congressman, the, uh, the pernicious enticement of individuals uh, to come to the border at great danger is perpetrated by the smuggling organizations. They are the ones that traffic in misinformation and seek to exploit vulnerable people exclusively for profit. So you don't think that open up, opening up uh, an operation where you're saying, if you'll get here, uh, we'll pay for your way to wherever you want to go, we'll put you up in a hotel, uh, we'll give you debit cards with money on it. You don't think that's an enticement? Congressman, I, I believe that you are mischaracterizing the work of nonprofit organizations. So they don't do that. So is it your testimony uh, that nonprofit groups at the border do not provide financial assistance, they do not provide uh, transportation across the United States, that and is, they don't put, up, uh, put them up in housing? Th that is not my uh, testimony, Congressman, as I have said. Okay, so you agree that they do. Well, let me go back to my original question, which was, who's paying for this? Are you aware of who's funding these NGOs? Congressman, um, to what um, NGOs do you refer? Because if you I'll, are... I'll give you an example. Catholic Charities, Jewish Family Services, Lutheran Immigration, Refugee Services. My question is, are you aware of who is funding them um, and their operations at the border? Um, uh, Congressman, we are grateful. Are you aware of who's funding them was my question. Yes, and I'm answering your question. Okay, who's funding them? Uh, we are grateful for the appropriations that Congress have issued. So the United States taxpayer is funding them is what you're saying. Uh, just to be specific, uh, Catholic Charities received over $1.4 billion from the United States taxpayers uh, for their operations encouraging illegal immigration. Uh, Lutheran Ref Immigration and Refugee Services reported it received $179 million in U.S. government grants. That makes up over 80% of their total support. So let me ask you this question. Since they're receiving this money, do you believe the number of grants and contracts awarded to NGOs is something that should be made known to the American taxpayer? Should that be public information? Should we know how much money they're receiving for their operations? Uh, Congressman, we do make that information public. And what we do is when an individual makes a claim of credible fear under the asylum law. So the American the taxpayer States, should know how many grants and contracts are awarded to the NGOs. That's a fair request, right? I, as I mentioned, we do make that information so public. They should, so the American taxpayer should be aware of that information, right? Yes. And okay, let me ask you this. If I wanted to know where these NGOs are sending illegals that are coming across that they're helping facilitate uh, with financial support, is that a fair ask? Is that something the American people should know, where, where these folks are going? Congressman, you are mischaracterizing. No, no, I'm not situation. characterizing anything. I'm asking a question. Should the American people, should we know where they're being sent um, when they're entered into these organizations that are providing the assistance? Is that a fair ask? Congressman, your question um, misstates the um, underlying facts. If I can explain what occurs. Well, let, let me explain to you what occurred. I have requested for years, over two years, um, this information from Homeland. I've requested this information from Catholic Charities, Jewish Family Services, Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services, FEMA, three different airlines and even hotels. Each request has gone unanswered. And it seems to me that if our taxpayer dollars are being used to fund an operation whereby we're encouraging illegal immigration, we're encouraging through funding these organizations, people to make these deadly treks across our southern border. It seems to me that we should be able to get some answers to questions. And I'm really disappointed that I can't get answers to those questions. I can't even get acknowledgement uh, from you about what's happening there when you've stated that you're partners with these organizations. And I yield back. 
Gentlemen, yields back to ter- if, we, if we can, Mr. Secretary, we'll go five, five two more fives, and then we'll, we'll take a break. If, that, if that's good with chair. you guys. So let's go. I think the gentlelady from Pennsylvania is up next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. And thank you, Secretary Mayorkas. And please express my thanks to all the good people uh, under your watch and under your guidance in the Department of Homeland Security for what you do to keep us safe. 300 people a day. In this country, on average, 300 people a day die of overdose. We know that 80% of those, fentanyl poisoning. We have a serious problem. And I thank you for taking it seriously and doing what you can to interrupt and interdict uh, the poisoning uh, of Americans and interdict uh, illicit drugs coming across our country. It wasn't so long ago, it was back in May, that I joined uh, Representative uh, Escobar uh, at uh, the border in El Paso. Got to meet with really terrific folks doing this work. What I'd like to say is we have a serious problem but we don't have folks on the other side of the aisle serious about solving it. When they blame you, you are responsible for every one of the fentanyl deaths. What a disservice and a disgrace to the families in my district who have lost children and who will lose children to this fentanyl poisoning. It is a disgrace for folks to just demonize you, demonize those coming across our border seeking refuge. Can you tell us? On average, what are the facts about what's coming across our border through ports of entry in terms of illicit drugs, specifically fentanyl? Congresswoman, um, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection data uh, evidences that uh, more than 90 percent of the fentanyl that is brought into this country is trafficked through the ports of entry, which is why we have surged operations to those ports of entry to increase the interdiction of fentanyl that is causing so much death and destruction in our country. And who is bringing it across? Um, uh, I believe the data suggests that approximately 70 percent of the people arrested um, uh, are U.S. citizens. Which makes perfect sense. Would you put uh, your resource for the cartels and those who are selling this, would you put that resource on the back of a migrant likely not to make it across so that you would be able to sell this valuable, deadly resource. It makes perfect sense, coming mostly through ports of entry, coming mostly by way of Americans, American citizens. It's shocking. But the seriousness that is lacked on the other side, they don't want to hear the facts. They don't want to solve this problem. They don't want to save lives, because if they did, they'd stop demonizing you, and they'd stop demonizing the migrant. Can you tell us about uh, what you said in your testimony, in your words, you said fentanyl is one of the most urgent and lethal threats to American communities today. Could you tell us about operations Blue Lotus and Four Horsemen that stopped nearly 10,000 pounds of fentanyl from entering the U.S.? Congresswoman, these operations um, reflect a surge of personnel and technology to enhance our interdiction capabilities and to arrest the perpetrators of this trafficking. I served as a prosecutor for 12 years. I I prosecuted cocaine traffickers, methamphetamine traffickers, even black tar heroin traffickers. We have not seen uh, a a drug as dangerous as fentanyl and other synthetic uh, opioids. Their toxicity make it extraordinarily challenging, as well as the profitability and ease of manufacture. It is because of the extraordinary work of U.S. Customs and Border Protection personnel, Homeland Security Investigations personnel, other personnel throughout the Department of Homeland Security, working with our law enforcement and international partners, that we have been able to enhance and increase our interdiction and arrest capabilities, and we are seeing the results. And I'd like to say, again, on the topic of seriousness, if my friends on the other side of the aisle were serious about saving lives, from this fentanyl crisis. Uh, They would have voted for the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which included $430 million of investment to modernize our ports of entry and to help improve CBP. Or maybe they would have, not a single person on the other side of the aisle, voted for the 2023 omnibus bill. All House Judiciary Republicans opposed. It funded additional staffing for CBP's ports of entry. They're not serious people. They don't want to solve this problem. I wear this band for Jake, the son of a friend of mine, 
uh, who died from fentanyl poisoning, and they said, please do something about it. I thank you for what you and your members are doing about it. General Lady yields back. The chair recognizes General Lady from Indiana. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll be brief and let yield my time since I'm kind of wasting my time here. I'll be honest with you. Uh, Secretary Mayorkas, do you take full responsibility for all decisions of action and in, in, or inaction made at your agency? Do you personally take full responsibility? For, uh, for all of the decisions made at your agency. I am the secretary of the department. So it means I, yes. I bear ultimate responsibility so, for the decisions so yes. made. Yes, okay. So you mentioned earlier that in your definition you have operational control of the border. Can you define what you mean by that? Uh, what we mean, um, because the, the, under the Secure Fence Act, it uh -huh. means that not a single yeah. individual would cross the border, and under that definition, no administration has had operational control. <laughs> so what way, number do you have? I, five million, ten, if less than five or ten, or le less than a couple hundred thousand get away or more? I mean, what is your definition? What we do, uh, Congresswoman, is we Do you have look, a number? What we do is we look at the resources that we have available to us and ask ourselves, are we deploying those resources to achieve the most effective results for the American people. That is what we do, and we are hopeful, working with you and other members of this committee, to increase the funding for the Department of Homeland Security. So, so fine, we're here funding, we're funding, funding, but I've been at the border and you've been at the border too. How would you grade your job from on a scale of zero to 10? How would you grade yourself? Congresswoman, I am immensely proud so what, how would you grade yourself? Congresswoman, I am immensely proud to work with the men and women of the Department of Homeland No, yourself, your, your job, not all of the women. I love a lot of, I'm sure there are a lot of great men and women in your department. How would you rate your job as a head of your agency? It is the honor of my From life. zero to ten, so you cannot grade it. How, how would grade your preparedness to this committee meeting on scale from zero to ten? We ask information, you all these promises, ladder. I'm not wasting my time. I'm sorry, I don't want to use bad word, but you can do with all this ladders because we keep giving money and sending ladder and you tell us BS back. So how would you rate yourself, your preparedness to this committee? It is the honor Question. of my lifetime to work with the so From scale zero to 10, how would you say how prepared you came to this hearing? Uh, I will repeat uh, what I said. So you're not answering any questions. You are not answering any Republican question. Is it something that your intent to not respond to any questions of Republicans, you came with that intent? That is incorrect, Congressman. Well, you're not answering any questions. It is. I mean, I, every time I hear you say, we will, we will, we shall, yeah, I don't know. You don't, you don't know any numbers. You don't even know how many people you actually, you know, you, you were prosecuted, how many people you deported, you're nothing. How can you say you know how you, your department is run? As executive, you don't know these numbers? Congresswoman, let me share with you. Well, you haven't shared anything useful here. Let me share I'm with sorry you. I, to tell you, I'll yield to Chairman Jordan because I'm not going to be wasting your time with this charade and circus. You do not have an intent to do that. And it is a serious national security issue. This border and cartels are stronger. A lot of money and Joes are making who knows what and probably a lot of corruption over there. And we have a national security crisis. And you're sitting here and saying, you know, looking at us with very smiley face, it's unacceptable. But I yield to Chairman Jordan. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, Mr. Secretary, of the 140 uh, illegal aliens you've encountered who are on the terrorist watch list, again, this is Mr. Ice's question earlier in the day. What is the status of those 140 individuals? First of all, let me, let me um, uh, allow the record to reflect that I'm not smiling, okay. nor have I smiled. Yeah. Um, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, will you repeat your question, please? The 140 individuals who have been encountered on the border who are on the terrorist watch list, what's the status of those individuals? Uh, I, I believe that question already has been posed, and I mentioned to the chairman that we will provide that data to you. Have any of them been released, I guess, is another way of framing that. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, let me say this. Individuals who pose a threat to public safety or national security are detained pending their removal. Well, that's not what the inspector general said. He said CBP released a migrant on the terrorist watch list and ICE faced information sharing challenges planning and conducting the arrest. This is from Mr. Kufari, the Inspector General, DHS. You disagree with Mr. Kufari? Uh, we respectfully do. You do? Okay. I would yield my time to the gentleman from uh, Louisiana. I've only got 25 seconds. I'll just say I don't have time for a question because you'll be elusive. But I just, for the record, since we're stating things for the record, 
I've been in Congress seven years. I think you're the most dishonest witness that has ever appeared before the Judiciary Committee. And I think I speak for a lot of my colleagues. This is such a frustrating exercise for us because our constituents want answers. They're tired of the open border. They're tired of people dying from Mr. Chairman, overdoses. And it's your fault. It's my time. Mr. Chairman, point of order. No, there's no point of order in the middle of this. This is my opinion. I think there it's is, shared by millions of American people. Based on the standard, you show no shame. Chairman, this is based she's on the room. standard that the chairman set out in previous hearings. Calling a witness dishonest is over the line that you drew in a previous hearing. I'm not pulling the words down. That speaks for the American people. Uh, the, the chair now recognized, I said to the secretary, we would go uh, five more minutes and then, then give you a break. I know you've been at this two and a half hours. I believe the gentleman from Florida is recognized for five minutes. I don't have a winter house yet, Mr. Chairman, but. Um, I knew it was Maryland. I knew you were right. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Secretary Mayorkas, I, um, I want to thank you for being here today. I, I, I do want to say a couple of things, though. I'm not um, trying to get too deep into this, but um, I know this is an oversight hearing. Unfortunately, though, the larger picture is that this is really about the effort to impeach you. I also serve on the Homeland Security uh, Committee, and I, you know, one of the members of that committee talked explicitly about uh, the Republican effort to impeach you, working the two committees working in coordination. Uh, he said something about, you know, pay attention. You, you can get the popcorn and watch this because it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, unfortunately, you've been sort of thrust into the middle of that. And, and uh, not your doing, but uh, that's where we are. And there are also efforts, obviously, to um, impeach President Biden. I've seen articles of impeachment with respect to that. The articles, the first articles to impeach, you came out two years ago. I'm not even sure you started unpacking uh, in your office yet, but uh, I, I do appreciate the fact that you're doing a very tough job under very difficult circumstances, uh, and I want you to continue working forward on that. I, there's a couple of things that I, I hadn't really wanted to get into, but um, my Republican colleagues have made so much about it, and that's the the CISA disinformation issue. Uh, and I know there are different views about that. We've done this on Homeland Security as well. But uh, I, I do want to point out that I think there's, a, there's an important role for the, the federal government to play in dealing with disinformation. And by that, I mean false information. Um, the Republican election deniers, including former President Trump, that's disinformation that needs to be addressed by the government not just uh, to deal with it in the past, but because of upcoming elections. I know there are election officers across the country at the state and local level who've been trying to put together a plan to deal with these issues. A lot of the disinformation comes from overseas, but we get some of it uh, here in the United States, even by national elected officials. Some are members here in the Congress. And I think it's important for us to address that to make sure that the, elect the elections that are done in 2024 uh, are done in a way that's consistent with the law and that allows people to base their work, their decisions on real information. And also, I want to say this too. I mean, the election deniers and the false information that's been put out there has put a lot of individuals at risk. Sometimes their lives have been threatened. These are these people were volunteer election judges, the state and local level across the country. Um, some of them had to move. There was one in Arizona I read about who, you know, his, his life had been threatened. Uh, and it's not just the election uh, workers either. Nina Jankowitz, who was actually a, a, a worked at DHS briefly, got the same kind of treatment. And so she came under attack, again, by, in some instances, members of the House Republican Caucus, uh, to the point where she ended up having to not only resign her job, but uh, she had to hire a consultant to help her with uh, personal protection. And this is while she was pregnant. She had to go to some of her appointments with her doctor in disguise because her life was, had been threatened uh, to such an extent. I, I, I'll close with this. I, I think that um, there are a lot of things that I would love to see this commission address. I made a personal appeal several months ago to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle about gun violence. Um, I think you mentioned an aspect of that, which is domestic terrorism that's uh, in some instances led to lone wolves committing mass uh, killings. Uh, but we got a larger problem with it than that. But I can't get anybody to help me with the ghost guns issue. I've got a bill about raising the age for assault weapons from 18 to 21, which I thought would be a reasonable 
uh, place to go since we already have an, the, the raise the age place took place for, uh, for handguns from 18 to 21 in the previous Congress and got bipartisan support. Uh, and, and, you know, it would be important, I think, too, to look at some of the other critical issues the country's facing. Cybersecurity, if we're going to dabble in the homeland security world, uh, China just hacked our Commerce Secretary, uh, and in May, uh, CISA was breached, Microsoft and the NSA. So these are very important issues to the, uh, to the American people. I hope we can take a look at these. One last point on the immigration piece. Uh, I was in a meeting on Friday with a venture capitalist in New York, and um, one of the things he said was that he's having trouble getting the visas taken care of to bring talent over from overseas. Uh, these are, you know, high-tech jobs, engineers and the like. Uh, so since he can't get it done in the United States, he's now setting up offices in Canada because they can get the job done there. I would love to see us address the immigration issue in a comprehensive way. Somebody mentioned H.R. 2 earlier, uh, which I thought was kind of funny because Senate Republicans were telling us that that was going to be DOA when it got over there. So we know that's not a real solution. With that, I yield back. The gentleman from Maryland yields back. Uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, we don't have to take a break unless you want it. If you want to keep going, we'll keep going. If, we, if you want a short break, we'll take a break. I defer to the chairman. Okay, well then, then we can sit right there and take questions. If we appreciate that. The gentleman from Wisconsin is recognized for five minutes. May, may I may I reserve yeah. my right? Uh, of course, if needed. of course. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Secretary, um, I want to go back to the operational control issue that came up first by the ranking member when Congressman Nadler brought it up. Um, and, and you've addressed it, and I know that Mr. Roy uh, worked through that again, but it's so important. And I think it's such a source of frustration because every time you turn on a TV, there is this imagery that continues, which is people coming across the border. And whether I was in McCallum or, or in San Diego sector, wherever I was, when you talk to Border Patrol or you talk to your employees, Homeland Security, none of them, none of them say, yeah, everything is going well and there is certainly an operational control in place. So even by the definition, which you brought up a couple times, the Secure Fence Act, it, it, I don't think anybody asked you again today directly, do you believe that we have operational control at the border right now? Under the statutory definition. Right, under the statutory definition, do we have it? Under the statutory definition, Congressman, not a single individual can cross the border if one has operational control. Last year, approximately 1.7 million people crossed the border. We provide that information to Congress on a monthly basis. Under that definition, no administration has had operational control. What we do, what we do is ensure that the resources that we have are deployed most effectively to gain the greatest amount of control that we can. And I will tell you that the greatest resource that we have are the men and women of the Department of Homeland Security. Right, but what I think I just heard you say was, right now, I heard about the previous administrations. You know, you, you already established, I guess, that there was not operational control. So right now, we do not have operational control of the border. Is it, can, can, you, can you tell me that right now to uh, under this, this committee? Un, under the definition of the Secure right. Fence Act, right. we do not and no administration has because that means that not a single individual crosses the border. Okay, okay, so we established that we do not have operational control right now. Under the definition of the Secure Fence Act. All right, so let me ask you a couple other questions, because I think there's an, there's an there's certainly I think we're acquiring numbers right now that I think are changing the dynamic of where <clears throat> we're at. Are unlawful entries between the ports of entry down right now, do you believe, or? or are they being measured differently than they had been prior to Title 42? Uh, prior to Title 42, the yeah. numbers are down, Congressman. And that is a function of the approach that we have taken to expand lawful pathways and then deliver consequences for individuals who do not avail themselves of those pathways. So is that number only migrants stopped by Border Patrol agents. Is, is that the number that you're focused on? Or, or is, it, is it a number, 
number of individuals beyond those that even have contact with Border Patrol. When we speak of, for example, the, the, the two weeks, let's just pick a period of time, the two weeks immediately preceding uh, the end of Title 42 uh, uh, on, May, on May 12th, when we take those two weeks and we compare the numbers that we are experiencing now, we include not only the apprehensions in between the ports of entry, Congressman, but we also include individuals who are um, entering through the ports of entry using one of the critical lawful pathways that we include. Found inadmissible at any ports of entry, categorical parole, illegal aliens, would also be part of that group. Is that not accurate? And then finally, gotaways. I'm so sorry. there's there's three categories of individuals we, as well. We don't we don't um, our, our parole authority, which is a discretionary authority, uh, codified in statute in the Immigration and Nationality Act, is a discretionary authority that we employ on a case by case basis. What we do is we define categories of individuals. Um, who uh, can access that, but we make the parole de decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. And then, so the actual total, this, these are the numbers that have been presented. 294,000 or 9,500 roughly a day right now are, are coming across. So do you, do you think at any point that that number uh, is being padded? I don't know how else to describe it. Maybe that's not the best term. But it, it's changed significantly than the way things were being counted prior to Title 42. No, co Congressman, uh, we don't pad numbers. Uh, we uh, provide uh, numbers. We act in the Department of Homeland Security with integrity and honor. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentlelady from Texas is recognized. Mr. Secretary, thank you for your honorable and selfless public service to our nation. As the only representative on this committee who was born, raised, and has lived on the border her entire life, I can say with absolute certainty that if we want to blame anyone for our broken immigration system, we should blame Congress. Those who yell the loudest about this issue uh, in Congress need to take a long, good look in the mirror. For 37 years, Congress has failed to address our country's need for comprehensive immigration reform. Instead, we have followed the Republican playbook, which focuses on immigration solely as a border issue. We've spent hundreds of billions of dollars securing the border, and it has been an expensive failure. And amidst an historic hemispheric refugee crisis, coupled with con congressional inaction, the situation has only grown more challenging. The longer we wait to pass comprehensive immigration reform, the more challenging this issue will become. But it doesn't have to be this way. Over the past three decades, the federal government has chosen to narrow and limit legal immigration pathways, which has shifted the pressure to the border and communities like mine. The Biden administration has proven, however, that when we open up legal pathways for asylum seekers and other migrants, the border can be better managed, and the proof is in the data. But the problem we face today is that the majority of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are only interested in performance, which is why they yell so loudly and try to turn the nation's attention away from their own lack of solutions. And that's what this hearing is ultimately about. While this is an oversight hearing, we know that the spectacle you're seeing on the other side is part of the Republicans' ultimate distraction strategy, impeachment. They aren't just focused on impeaching you, Mr. Secretary, uh, despite the fact that apprehensions at the border are down by 70 percent. They have also promised the extremists in their party that they will impeach Attorney General Merrick Garland and even President Biden. In fact, from the complaints we hear about Catholic charities, I'm surprised uh, that they aren't trying to impeach the Pope. Secretary Mayorkas, I'd like a simple yes or no, if possible, on the following questions. And I have a chart here from the American Immigration Council that uses CBP data, uh, historical data, on border apprehensions. Isn't it true, Mr. Secretary, that according to CBP data, apprehensions of families started significantly climbing around January, February of 2019 during the Trump administration? Uh, yes, uh, Congresswoman, they did. 
Isn't it true, according to CBP data, that after a drop of apprehensions that were largely a result of COVID closures in 2020, apprehensions began increasing again significantly around May of 2020 after the Trump administration initiated the use of Title 42. Congresswoman, I would have to defer um, to Customs and Border Protection. And well, I, I have it right here. And actually, I'd like to enter into the record the American Immigration Council's data, border apprehensions October 2015 through June 2023. Uh, isn't it true, uh, and for the record, May of 2020, when we began seeing an increase once again post-COVID, that was a full six months before the 2020 general election, before President Biden's victory, and eight months before President Biden's inauguration. Isn't it true, Mr. Secretary, that opening up legal pathways, as DHS has done via the CBP-1 app, that that has proven successful in helping uh, manage the border? It, has, it is one element of, a, of an approach that has proven successful, Congresswoman. And isn't it true, Mr. Secretary, that the one legislative body that can further open up legal pathways in order to best manage the border is Congress? Yes, Congresswoman. My Republican colleague, Maria Salazar, and I introduced the Dignity Act, which is a bipartisan comprehensive immigration reform bill. And I'd encourage my colleagues who are seeking a true solution to join our effort to address our broken system. Anything short of that is a dereliction of Congress's responsibility and obligation. Um, and all of this scapegoating on the Biden administration and on you in particular, Mr. Secretary, is nothing but performance. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Mr. Gentleman from Oregon is recognized. Mr. Chairman, um, uh, that's, um, oh, okay. may, may, Mr. I, may I impose oh, sure, 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 uh, and, sure. and accept your uh, yeah. kind offer for a, a, <laughs> Understand. a brief we'll a, break? We'll take a brief five-minute break. We're trying to go as quickly as we can because we got votes at 1.30 and we'd prefer not to come back. I'm sure that's the same with you. But if we have to, we'll come back. So we'll take a five-minute recess now, and then we'll be back in action.
The committee will come to order. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield my time to the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Benz. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Moran. Mr. Secretary, before I start, I just want to talk briefly about what I heard earlier. One of the, my colleagues from across the aisle suggested that we Republicans were somehow manufacturing outrage. Uh, the phrase was right-wing outrage machine was the phrase that he used. I thought, what is, are, the, are the folks across the aisle not outraged about the, about the millions of people that are coming across the border under, under of course, your watch, uh, that most of whom uh, probably don't qualify for asylum? Yet, don't you think that all of us should be outraged about the th thousands dying from fentanyl that's coming across the border under your watch? And don't you think that we should be outraged about cartels moving into American cities on this side of the border under your watch? And don't you think we should be outraged about the billions of dollars the cartels are raising uh, from the most unfortunate and vulnerable from Central America and other places under your watch? And don't you think we should be outraged about the hundreds dying in the desert? I mean, yeah, it's hard to, to, to argue, I think, that we're manufacturing outrage when we look at, at these incredible, sad things happening under your watch. Now, I, I want to go to how we can fix, perhaps, some of that which you've been talking about for the last couple of hours. Because you said earlier, in response to a question from Congressman Issa, uh, that we, um, um, the USA, is not, quote, alone in some of its infirmities in its immigration system. I'm just quoting from you. I scribbled it down quickly. Infirmities in our immigration system. What? Give us a couple. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, infirmities in our immigration system is how you put it uh, when you were comparing our immigration system to others across the world. Just share two. Um, let me give you uh, one example in the economic arena um, that um, uh, the market needs of our country, the economic needs of our country um, are not taken into account when we um, admit economic migrants. We have uh, statutory caps, statutory limits on the number of people we can admit despite uh, perhaps a greater need at a particular time. We do not, we do not calibrate the number according to need. Right. So, so for example, and, and I, I understand. Yes. What, I actually understand what you're saying. Forgive me for cutting you off, but it leads very, very nicely to how we might address uh, immigration as a, a as a comprehensive system. And don't you think that politically, at least, a secure border is an essential prerequisite to any comprehensive solution? Because what you were just starting to talk about was one of the adjustments we might make to our uh, visa systems. And by the way, uh, I'm enthusiastic about trying to improve those visa systems. But I'll tell you this much, if I go back home to all of my constituents, as I'm going to be doing this Friday, uh, and, and I'm going to be talking to them on Monday at a Chamber of Commerce meeting, guess what? <laughs> they're outraged about the things I mentioned earlier. And they're not going to want to listen to me talk about the, the details that you just suggested. And so tell me, how do I, what can we do, those infirmities, do they include anything when it comes to fixing the border so it works better? Yes. Tell me. So, for example, Congressman, and, and one of the measures that we have taken to address this infirmity is to issue a regulation that empowers our asylum officers to make the ultimate asylum adjudication and shrink the time in between an encounter at the border, and the ultimate asylum adjudication. That duration now, historically, has been six plus years. Thank you, that for, your thoughts on Thank you for your thoughts on that. And I'd like to follow up with you on it, if you would. I'm serious. Share with me your thinking on that issue. Uh, is it correct, as we heard, I went, I've been to the border three times, and the, and the, the folks down there suggest that, that the cartels are extracting between three and $5,000, maybe more, per person that presents illegally at the border. Is that true? Yes, Congressman. And so that would mean as the millions of people come in, we can multiply that times four or $5,000. Is that correct? Uh, Congressman, um, that is correct, which is precisely why, precisely why one of our uh, efforts is to cut the smugglers out of the equation because of the profits they make, because of their ruthlessness, 
because of their criminality. And, and so, and, 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 and for, forgive me for cutting you off, but I agreed to yield the balance of my time to to the chair, Mr. Mr. Uh, I, I, I appreciate the gentleman uh, yielding, um, Mr. Secretary. Um, is the number of people removed? Uh, Been through it, objection, Mr. Chairman. This isn't Mr. Bence's time. Um, oh, that's right. It was yielded to Mr. Bence. I know. I know, but I thought we could get away with it because it was an important question. <laughs> well, Mr. Chairman, you can have the next person yield. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I we're going to do that. Yeah. All right. The gentleman yields back. Chair, I recognize the gentleman from North Carolina. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and that, that was not done with any ill will. It no, was I, 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 I knew that from the get-go. Yes. Um, Mr. Secretary, I know it's been a, a long day already. Um, I want you to know that I'm here today uh, to use my five minutes in support of a group of 250,000 plus young people in our country who are referred to as the documented dreamers. Um, they're a too often forgotten population of talented young adults who are American in every way except on paper. And as I'm sure you're aware, since we've talked about them a few times, the documented dreamers are dependent children of long-term employment visa holders who are brought to the United States with documentation when their parents move here to work. And often these children come to the United States when they're still babies, but because they were not born here, they don't have citizenship or a real path to citizenship before they become 21. And while many of these young adults are in line for green cards with their parents, the backlog at USCIS is so long that they often face a decades-long wait. As a result, they risk having to self-deport when they turn 21 and age out of their dependent visas if they cannot find another status to stay in the United States legally. I have a bipartisan, bicameral bill to provide these children and young adults with a pathway to permanent residency protections for aging out of the immigration system. And I'm working hard to get that through the House and Senate. We got it through in two different forms last Congress through the House. However, today I want to hear about what your, your department is doing to protect these diver, deserving young people and enable them to stay here. We've educated them using our tax dollars, that which their parents pay. They often self-deport to countries that compete with us at age 21 after having a few years of college. And so I'll get into um, at least one of my questions. In a 2014 decision on whether the Child Status Protection Act requires priority date for retention for children who have aged out of their visa, the Supreme Court deferred to agency interpretation of CSPA which does not provide for a priority date retention for most individuals who turn 21 while waiting for green cards sought by their parents. However, Justice Kagan, writing for the plurality, emphasized that CSPA permits, not that it requires this narrow interpretation of the statute that USCIS currently holds. Allowing documented dreamers to retain their original priority date and keep their place in line after they age out of their dependent visas could significantly improve the lives of this population. Why has USCIS not adopted a priority date retention for these individuals, given that the Supreme Court determined that the agency possesses this authority? Congresswoman, I, I will um, consult with the Director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services and get back to you. I'm not familiar with that precise issue. Okay. Um, I only have about a minute left. So when I met with the documented dreamers, which I do quite frequently because they have learned how to petition the government for redress of their grievances, I am struck by the love of, the country, of this country and their eagerness to contribute to all of our welfare. And their stories are some of the most compelling that I've heard during my time in Congress. Does your department have any plans 
to protect these deserving young adults who have done everything right, been here legally, and are losing their ability to live in this country through no fault of their own. Congresswoman, I, I share your concern for these individuals who have indeed contributed so much to this country and who know no other country but this one. I can assure you I will follow up with vigilance on the questions that you have posed and respond as promptly as possible. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I yield back. General Lady yields back. Gentleman from Oregon is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield my time to you. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, is the number greater than zero? Can you tell us that? The number of people who've been encountered on the border, over the two million uh, number, encountered on the border, put in removal proceedings, adjudicated, and then removed. Is that number greater than zero? Yes. Is it greater than 100? Yes. Greater than 1,000? Congressman, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, forgive me. Mr. Chairman, as I have say, stated before, the data that you wish to have we will provide to you as promptly as possible. What I don't want to do is misspeak when it comes to data. I do not and want to And I can appreciate that, but we have a history where we've asked questions before in a hearing. You told us the same thing, and you don't get it back to us. So we're trying to get as much as we can on the record in a public hearing, and you've now told me it's, some, it's greater than 100, but you don't know if it's greater than 1,000 out of the 2-point-something million who've come to the country, okay. been encountered, and put in removal proceedings. So we know it's greater than 100. You say you're going to get back with us, but the history has been not too good on your part in getting us those answers. M Mr. Chairman, of course it's more than 1,000. Um, but what I want to assure you of, because is it frankly, more than a hundred thousand? Because quite frankly, Mr. Chairman, we have been cooperative with this. No, you committee. haven't. We have provided you with documents. We have provided you with data. I can keep putting briefings. up the redacted documents, but yeah. you have not. I would yield back to the gentleman. I appreciate the time, so we can yield to another member. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield my time to Mr. Johnson from Louisiana. Thank you, Mr. Mayorkas. In answer to my questions earlier today, you defined misinformation, and you acknowledged that CISA created in 2021 the Misinformation and Disinformation Committee. On April 27, 2022, you testified in the House Appropriations Committee that your department created then another agency or another subdivision, the Disinformation Governance Board, and you said under oath it was to combat misinformation ahead of the 2022 elections. Earlier this month, the federal court in the landmark case of Missouri v. Biden affirmed lengthy findings of fact to justify its preliminary injunction, and in the ruling found at page 94, the White House and your agency pressured and encouraged social media companies to suppress free speech that you determined, you and your, your employees determined to be misinformation. However, a couple of hours ago, when I asked you about this, you said under oath, we don't do that. Which time were you telling the truth, today or on April 27, 2022? Congressman, uh, we do not um, suppress uh, free speech. Did you and or anyone working for you work with the social media companies prior to the 2022 election to pull things off the internet, suppress things off the internet that your folks determined to be false or misinformation? Not to my knowledge, Congressman. So you had no idea what the, the misinformation and disinformation committee was doing during that period? Uh, C Congressman, uh, I have uh, answered that question previously. Let me assure you that we safeguard the First Amendment rights of individuals uh, that is what we do. Let me explain to you what the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency I know all about CISA. What I'm concerned about is this committee and the dystopian disinformation governance board that you set up and put Nita Jankowitz in charge of for about three weeks until the public uh, blew their tops over that and you that suddenly disappeared and she resigned. How, were you, how did you instruct Nina Jankowitz to discern what is mis misinformation and false information that the government should pull off the internet? You are assuming uh, facts that actually did not exist. Tell me what the facts are. What, what, what guidance did you give her? Um, Congressman, the, real, the reality is that disinformation is a tool that adverse nation states use to undermine our democracy. Okay. Four adverse nation states include No, no, hold North on, Korea. hold on. Don't, go, don't talk about foreign adversaries because the court and the witnesses on your behalf in the court testifying under oath different than what you're saying today, that they made no distinction between foreign people who put things on the internet and domestic voices. Do you disagree with that statement? 
Congressman, can you share with me the context of that statement? It would be awesome if you had read the federal court opinion that directly says that your agency is involved in the greatest cover-up of the, or the free speech in U.S. history. But yeah, I'll tell you what the, the, the court says. It says people involved with your agency were meeting regularly with the social media platforms and giving them lists of persons and information that they said should be pulled off the internet, suppressed. That means turned down, volume censored so no one saw it. And the court said millions, millions of free speech protected postings were not seen by the American people prior to the 2022 election because your employees subjectively determined that they shouldn't see it. That's the problem. And the idea that you would sit here in front of us and pretend like you don't know that was happening is, is just alarming. I, I'm out of words to describe how frustrated we are with you and your department. I'm out of time. Gentleman from Oregon yields back the gentle lady from uh, Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, Secretary Mayorkas. Um, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, we appreciate your patience and your testimony. Mr. Secretary, as you know, DHS is responsible for the public safety of the United States of America, and the men and the women at DHS work very hard every day so that Americans can pursue the freedoms of their everyday lives. And the mission of DHS is somewhat ubiquitous be it at airports or disaster sites, that many overlook the fact that much of it is the same federal agency. In addition to these crucial areas, DHS has also been active in combating America's gun violence epidemic, which of course I am extremely invested in. It's an issue that is very um, important to me as many other survivors around the country um, as well. Studies have shown that between 70 to 90 percent of weapons recovered from crime scenes in Mexico can be traced back to the United States of America. With weapons of war commercially available at low levels of individual scrutiny, gun traffickers have been taking immense advantage of our guns, lack, uh, our nation's gun um, laws, which are very lax, to arm drug cartels that also fuel a lot of organized crime. In addition, we have seen that payment for these gun traffickers has at times resulted in op opioids that have helped our communities um, be torn apart as well. DHS has been swiftly, as you have mentioned over and over again today, combating these kind of illicit dealings through its joint efforts with the ATF-led uh, operation Southbound. Mr. Secretary, DHS has taken a collaborative approach um, with the ATF-led Operation Southbound. Can you tell us just a little bit more about this operation? I believe a lot of people don't really know that it exists, and uh, DHS, uh, DHS is role in it. We'd like to hear about that and the results of this operation. Congressman, uh, one of the concerns uh, that law enforcement has is that the, the firearms that are in the hands of the transnational criminal organizations to the south of our border actually uh, emanated from the United States. And we, uh, in the Department of Homeland Security, through our Homeland Security investigations, working in collaboration, as you have noted, with other federal agencies, um, are conducting operations uh, to interdict the flow of firearms outside from within the United States uh, external to uh, external uh, countries and um, to prevent them from reaching the hands of criminals. And I would be very pleased, given the law enforcement sensitivity of the operations, to provide you with greater details about how we are accomplishing that objective. Thank you so much. And with weapons of war, such as <clears throat> high capacity automatic firearms, easily available in far greater quantities in the United States than ever before. Can you illustrate how these firearms uh, trafficking, how the firearm trafficking contributes to organized crime and gun violence in the United States? Well, the, the trafficking in the guns themselves um, uh, is a criminal activity uh, uh, that is a for-profit activity. So when the criminal organizations gain greater profits, they uh, only uh, un tragically uh, expand their criminality. In addition, uh, the transnational criminal organizations that receive uh, the weaponry from the United States uh, conduct a violent acts that uh, impact uh, individuals who seek to enter the United States as well as Americans themselves. 
Thank you. And can you tell us a little bit more about how the export of these weapons of war directly relate to the opioid crisis in our communities in the United States? Uh, it is um, um, the criminality of these organizations is inextricably intertwined with one another. They conduct their operations uh, by protecting themselves and uh, addressing uh, law enforcement uh, through criminal means, and that includes uh, violent acts. And those violent acts are perpetrated with firearms, and sometimes those firearms uh, originate from the United States. It is a web of criminality, and we are unrelenting in our efforts to disrupt and dismantle every aspect of that criminality. I'm intensely proud of the men and women who dedicate their lives to that effort in the Department of Homeland Security and throughout our law enforcement partner community. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate your dedication and those that serve right along with you uh, in this manner. We really appreciate you. I yield back. General yields back. Gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I have rarely been more gobsmacked by the lack of cooperation and information from a witness than I have by you today. It is truly appalling when you consider that lives are at stake, the lives of uh, children being trafficked across this border who are uh, being sacrificed on an altar of radical policies being pushed by your department. You know, you talked about it. You threw out a good one-liner in your testimony about uh, child sex trafficking, human smuggling. Um, you know what does immense damage to our efforts to combat human trafficking, sex trafficking, child sex trafficking, a porous border. And your policies have directly led to that porous border, Mr. Secretary. This is, it is ridiculous that I've had to sit here and listen to you and your denials, your deflections, your obfuscations, the mendacity that I am hearing from you is not just appalling to me, it is appalling to my constituents. And I echo the comments from across this country, members who represent people from across this country over the last uh, two hours plus, uh, really echoing their constituents and the frustration that they have uh, actually shown and, and talked to them about. You know, back in April, we had a committee hearing where uh, there was a witness, a whistleblower, who said that the uh, U.S. federal government has essentially become a middleman in a multi-billion dollar human trafficking operation targeting unaccompanied minors at the southern border. I'm sure that that uh, makes you upset. It sure as heck made me upset. Uh, but when U.S. Customs and Border Protection encounters 435 unaccompanied minors per day, drug cartels and traffickers exploiting 60% of these children in prostitution, forced labor, and child pornography. To make matters worse, in June, the Biden administration released 344 children to non-related adults in the United States, most of whom already had multiple children in their care. These children are prime targets for traffickers, for sex, or for labor. In fact, a February New York Times article published showing migrants found laboring in violation of child labor laws. Uh, notably, half of U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement's most wanted criminals for child trafficking, guess where they come from? Mexico, imagine that. So when you actually take actions that reduce operational control of the border, these are actions that are taken in contradiction of your official duty to execute the laws enacted by Congress and your oath to support and defend the Constitution. Uh, you have uh, abandoned the successful border policies of the previous administration. You've ignored laws requiring detention of certain aliens, reduced detention capacity, ended migrant protection protocols, halted border wall construction, diverted border patrol from law enforcement duties, encouraged and mass illegal immigration with the use of easily exploitable credible fear processes, illegal expanded parole, reinstated catch and release, and provided illegal aliens valid work permits and public benefits during an economic downturn. You should be ashamed more so, you should be held accountable. This committee will do just that. And I am committed to making that happen as well. And with that, I'm going to yield the remainder of my time to the chairman. Uh, I appreciate the, the gentleman yielding. I would yield, to, well, actually, Mr. Mr., uh, Mr. Klein, can you yield to Mr. Roy and then maybe to Mr. Bishop? I'll yield to Mr. Roy. I thank the gentleman from Virginia. Uh, despite enormous levels of encounters, I believe last month was about 146,000 far, far exceeding what uh, Obama DHS Secretary Jay Johnson said at crisis levels of being 1,000 a week. 
We can agree, I think, that it's possible there may be a decrease from FY22 to FY23 for total uh, Border Patrol encounters, right? They're going down maybe 20%, according to data I see at current levels. Does that sound right? I think they, um, um, Congressman, I think they're uh, going down further in light of the approaches that we implemented in a post-Title 40. Okay, well, assuming they're going down and, uh, and accepting that they may be going down by Border Patrol encounters, hasn't there simultaneously been a significant and continuing increase at the ports of entry, which more than offset the reductions and illustrate the shell game? Uh, OFO encounters from FY22 to FY23, the data I have at current pace is 100% increase. FY20 to FY23, a 356% increase from 241,000 to 1.1 million. In other words, the American people need to be told the truth about what's actually happening. We, the total numbers, if you look at the nationwide encounters, FY20 to FY21, a 202% increase. FY20 to 22, a 328% increase. FY20 to FY23 at current pace, a 364% increase. In the last 24 hours, for Border Patrol alone, nationwide encounters are 6,000. That's the data I have. Is that correct? Uh, Congressman, our approach of expanding lawful pathways and delivering consequences is, is working. But, but is that data correct? Are those the numbers? I'd have to confirm the numbers that you have cited. Well, those are the numbers that we have, and this is what the American people are tired of. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you for being here, Secretary Mayorkas. St. Louis and I are here today, as always, to ask hard questions about real issues. Uh, Secretary Mayorkas, I'm concerned that the Department and the Office of Intelligence and Analysis, in particular, encourages the targeting of protesters, activists, incarcerated people, and progressive movements. Um, for example, in 2020, under the prior administration, uh, intelligence and analysis individual, uh, labeled individuals protesting police brutality and racial injustice after the killing of George Floyd as domestic violent extremists. And department leadership instructed officials to create and share intelligence dossiers about, quote, everyone participating in Portland protests unquote, as part of a discredited effort to link protesters to a non-existent terrorism plot. And these issues still continue to this day. Um, Secretary Mayorkas, do you acknowledge that the department has referred to opponents of the Atlanta Public Safety Training Center, or what we call Cop City, as alleged domestic violent extremists and militants comprising violent far-left occupation? And that's just a yes or no. Well, Congressman, um, a few things, I must say. Uh, first, uh, I'm immensely proud of the men and women who work in the Office of Intelligence and Analysis under the superb leadership of Kenneth Weinstein. Um, they do tremendous work in making sure the American people are safe and secure. I am familiar uh, with activities in Atlanta that are lawful, and I am also familiar with activities uh, to which you refer that are unlawful and uh, we do not condone violence we do safeguard and protect the free expression of speech okay. so um what you're saying is is that this um alleged domestic violent extremists um or militants that you that you're saying that you um condemn that language and you condemn I'm just I'm, I'm just trying to be clear because I, we can't both sides it when people are actually being hurt, and I can speak to it as an actual um, activist myself, and I've been there. I've seen what actually happens to protesters and what actually makes the media and what actually makes the reports. So I just want to make sure that we're saying that we that you're are you saying you domestic violent extremists because I, I have the report here. Are you saying that you condemn that or that that is part of the work? Congresswoman, lawful protest is a proud tradition in this country. There cannot be a connectivity between an ideology and the expression of that ideology through violent means. That is when we get involved to prevent violence. Uh, individuals are free to express their ideologies 
whatever we might think of those ideologies. Okay, okay, let me, let me, I, I have limited time. Let me reclaim my time. Let me just, let me go to my next question. Um, so are you aware that Georgia law enforcement officials have used those characterizations to support their charges of domestic terrorism against opponents of a cop city? I, I am, I am not. Congressman, I can't speak to state activity, state law enforcement. What I can do is speak of what we in the Department of Homeland Security do. Because when we don't call it out, when we don't address it, that's what happens. And I get it. You're not, you're, you know, you're not a part of the state, and you can't tell the state what to do, or you, you're not, you know, as interested involved in that, but when we don't speak up to it and we know what's happening, then they are able to do those things, and that's what this report is about. Um, and it actually affects real people. And let me just also say, the people that show up to protest, to protest, are usually the ones that care about the issue and are trying to save lives. Folks don't show up to protest usually unless they are sent there, and I know that happens too. But generally, the people that are at the protest, we care. Those folks are showing up because they want to see something done about policing in this community, in this country. They want to stop the fact that every single year we have a rise in police killings, and nobody is doing the actual work to fix it. And so by saying, hey, we're going to show up and put our bodies on the line, that, and then, and then turning that around to make it as though those are the folks who are violent, those are the folks who are extreme, if you stop the police violence, in this community, in this country, then nobody has to show up for a protest. Let me just say that. And lastly, I will say um, the, that uh, I'm concerned about the, de the department's policies against um, uh, related to immigration enforcement. I, but I will make sure that we get this documentation to you because I am out of time. Um, but lastly, I would like, Mr. Chairman, um, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record all the documents that I just spoke of. Without, without objection, uh, the, chair, uh, the gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes Ms. Lee, and then we'll go to Mr. Bandrew. Secretary Mayorkas, Florida's Attorney General has sued the Department of Homeland Security in the Northern District of Florida, asserting that the policies of your administration violate existing federal law. Federal Judge Alan Weatherall, who has heard evidence and testimony related to your policies, described your parole with alternatives to detention policy as follows. The evidence establishes that the administration have effectively turned the southern border into a meaningless line in the sand and little more than a speed bump for aliens flooding into the country by prioritizing alternatives to detention over actual detention and by releasing a million aliens into the country on parole or pursuant to the exercise of prosecutorial discretion under a wholly inapplicable statute without even initiating removal proceedings. Thereafter, after additional proceedings and evidence and testimony, the judge heard about your parole with conditions revision, which allows illegal immigrants to be paroled into the U.S. under the expectation that they will check in in 60 days and receive a notice to appear at a hearing where we can initiate removal proceedings in court. And there, the judge noted that all totaled only 18% of the aliens released under the parole with conditions policy after it was enjoined by the court have been issued a notice to appear and placed in removal proceedings. The additional 82% are either awaiting the issuance of an NTA or their whereabouts are unknown. Secretary Mayorkas, can you tell us as we sit here today, where are the people who have entered this country and been released under your, what you refer to as a parole program, where are they today? Um, uh, Congresswoman, um, the individuals who are released, because we do not have the detention capacity, we are not funded for the detention capacity to detain everyone, but let me assure you that individuals who pose a threat- Do you know where they are, Secretary Mayorkas? Congresswoman, if I may, um, I, I want to assure you that individuals who pose a threat to public safety or national security are detained. That is how we prioritize our detention authorities. Otherwise, we place individuals who are not such a threat on alternatives to detention. And do you know where those individuals those are? Those individuals are That would be a yes or no, Secretary Mayorkas. And those individuals are and I'll supervised. Take it that in this case, you do not. Now, about those who do not show up for failure to appear proceedings, for these notices to come to court, what are the consequences that those individuals face? Uh, those uh, individuals face the con consequence of apprehension 
and removal. Is it not true that it would be necessary to know who they are and where they are in order to actually initiate removal proceedings from the United States? There are those individuals whom we do know where they are, and we do initiate removal proceedings. And if individuals abscond, which is a concern that long predates this administration, Congresswoman, we have had absconders for many, many administrations. We have between 11 and 12 million undocumented people. When those individuals are apprehended, they are also subject to Secretary immigration. Secretary Mayorkas, what I will note is this. In addition to it being clear that the department has failed to timely respond to requests for information and data about the policies of this administration and the status of all of these individuals who have been released into our country, it is also clear from reviewing a record of the proceedings in the Florida federal court that that the department is failing to comply with orders of that court. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield the balance of my time. Would, would, the gentleman, the would the gentleman yield to the gentleman from North Carolina? Yes, I will yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from North Carolina. I thank the gentle, gentlewoman. And uh, Mr. Mayorkas, you've spoken a lot, of, lot about lawful pathways you've created. Uh, and I think you rely on your parole authority to do that. Is that right? That is one of the methods, yes, Congressman. Uh, what other method besides parole? What other source of authority besides parole? That is the primary, uh, the primary well, method. I, I, but, I know. But, no, but, but what, what's the other one, then, sure. if it's the primary one? Well, refugee processing is a lawful pathway. Okay, and that's established by statute, the refugee yes, program. Yes, and the parole authority is also codified in statute. It's a discretionary. Right, so, and so here's what it says. It says, uh, the Attorney General may, in his discretion, parole into the United States temporarily under such conditions as he may prescribe only on a case-by-case -case basis for urgent humanitarian reasons or significant public benefit, any alien applying for admission to the United States. And you've spoken today, it was interesting to me, it would attract my attention. You spoke about case-by-case -case being an individual determination. What is the source of authority that allows you to define categories or classes to then operate, you know, to bring people in and then look at them case-by-case? Congressman, uh, Congressman, as I've, I've stated, we exercise that parole authority on a case-by-case -case basis. But, but you define these categories or classes. What, what, let you, what allows you to do that? What authority do you rely on? That, that, that defines the perimeter of individuals who may become eligible for the case-by-case -case adjudications. Seems in tension to me, I yield. Yeah, good point. A lady from Vermont's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before I begin, I ask unanimous consent to request to enter into the record DHS data on U.S. Immigration and that Customs Enforcement. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Thank you for your public service. And I'm going to just shift gears a little bit here. Um, as you know, uh, Vermont has recently experienced the worst flooding in our state since the 1920s. Farms, houses, apartments, mobile homes, businesses, and shared community spaces have been devastated, including nearly every single small business in our downtown of our state capital, Montpelier. I've seen the destruction firsthand um, and can tell you the recovery is going to be long and hard. Uh, related to this, a larger issue I'd like to highlight with my time today is the lack of options for small businesses that cannot take on additional debt to rebuild. Um, SBA loans, of course, are a great help, but they are still loans. And we are a rural state made up primarily of small businesses. Um, of the 79,000 small businesses in our tiny state, 78% are independent contractors or non-employer businesses. So it is uh, incredibly challenging for these small businesses to rebuild and take on more liabilities. But their presence in these communities is absolutely vital. We are a rural state made up of small cities and towns and villages, all in these little river valleys, which are essentially isolated from each other. And we need the ability to rebuild these, these small businesses. So um, I've heard directly from these folks that they're having a really hard time imagining how they will rebuild. FEMA has been incredible. They were on the ground just a few days after the emergency. I was able to tour with uh, FEMA leadership as well as folks from Region 1. We are grateful for that help, but I want to make sure that over the long term, we are committed to working with FEMA and DHS to make sure that we find some long-term solutions for small businesses in particular to fill in this, this gap in the recovery. Um, along these lines, uh, Mr. Secretary, what can Congress do to aid DHS and FEMA in continuing 
to react to natural disasters like this, like the flooding in Vermont, which was supposed to be a 100-year flood cycle, and it happened uh, as recently as 12 years ago. So what can we do to partner with you to be more prepared for these? Thank you very uh, much, Congresswoman. I look forward to partnering with you and other members of the committee to address the challenges that our nation faces. One, one critical uh, need is, of course, uh, funding uh, for the disaster relief uh, services and assistance that we provide, whether that is uh, financial relief so that businesses and individuals uh, alike uh, can rebuild and recover. Uh, we also have critical grant programs uh, that really contribute to the resilience of local communities. That is one very significant way in which we can partner together, and I very much look forward to working with you. Thank you. And just to, to put a finer point on it, um, I was speaking with FEMA Administrator Chriswell when she uh, came up to Vermont. Um, is it accurate to say that FEMA's primary funding source, the Disaster Relief Fund, is going to go into the red as soon as August? Is that correct? That is correct, Congresswoman. Can you talk about the importance of DRF funding, especially as we prepare for another hurricane season and uh, these increasingly intense storms that we are, are bound to see continually as, as the air warms? The Disaster Relief uh, Fund is the nucleus of our efforts to assist communities in recovering from natural disasters, which are only increasing in frequency and severity. That is the core um, uh, fund through which we provide such needed relief for communities across this country, whether it's hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfires, flooding, uh, the, the natural disasters that we are seeing more and more often. Thank you. Just two more questions. Is there a role for the agency uh, in mitigating future disasters? You know, we often move emergency supplementals after the fact. Is there value to more focused um, funding for pre-disaster work, and what would that look like? Well, one of the one of the takeaways that I had when I visited Mayfield, uh, Kentucky, um, uh, with Congressman uh, Comer, uh, following a devastating uh, tornado, is. Um, assisting communities in revising their building codes so that they are ready for the weather that we encountered today and not the weather that we encountered 10 years ago. We really, as, an, as a nation, have to reform our infrastructure architecture to be ready for the extreme weather events that we are encountering today and, and will encounter tomorrow. Thank you. I know I'm, I'm just about out of time. I just want to make the final point here is that I think it's going to be important for all of us long term to think about how FEMA also can be a partner in dealing the, with the mental health consequences of these disasters, especially as they're happening more frequently. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Gentlelady yields back. We'll, uh, Mr. Secretary, we'll do one more, and then we got to go to votes on the floor, and then we'll, we'll, we'll come back after that. Mr. Van Drew is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Mayorkas, we stand here yet again to address a crisis that you've continued to make worse. As Secretary of Homeland Security, the American people have entrusted you with the security of their communities and the security of their nation. You have failed them. Our southern border has been turned into a revolving door for illegal immigration, drug trafficking, human trafficking, and threats to our national security. Is this the America we want? An America where every town is a border town? An America where our communities, infrastructure, and resources are strained under the weight of unchecked illegal immigration? We know the answer. Our constituents know the answer. The answer is no. The reality is that under your leadership, you've created the largest border crisis in the history of the United States of America. A crisis so badly handled that the international organization, and I want everybody to listen to this, the International Organization for Migration labored our southwest border as, quote, the deadliest land crossing in the world, end quote. Unbelievable for America. Are you aware of how many illegals have been encountered at our border and how many known gotaways have escaped into America? And I just want the numbers. Congressman, you speak of the, um, of the Southwest. Sir, border, I just I, want the numbers. And the, uh, the challenge of migration that we face. Thank you. I appreciate your answer. It's 5.6 million illegal alien encounters and 1.5 million known gotaways. 
How about the number of aliens on the terrorist screening database who have been caught? Not the ones who haven't been caught, but the ones who have been caught just in the last nine months. Do you know that number? I'm very pleased to provide that uh, to you. I do. It's 140. Thank you. How about the number unaccompanied minors processed in FY23? Do you know that number? Uh, similarly, Congressman, I'd be very pleased I, to provide. Thank you. I know that number myself. It's 152,000. We have seen a continuous surge of fentanyl coming from China, being distributed by Mexican drug cartels and destroying countless American lives. Are you aware of how many Americans died? How many Americans died in 2021 at the hands of fentanyl? I am aware of those numbers, Congressman. 71,000. 71,000 human souls. These numbers are staggering, and they are a direct result of your actions as secretary, actions that have dismantled effective immigration policies and broken the rule of law. Your lies to Congress and the American people that put American citizens in danger every single day. And in my mind, in my mind, this makes your actions criminal. All of us all this leaves us at a crossroads, a moment in time where our actions will define the future of the United States of America. This is a call to action, a call to restore sanity at our borders and safety in our communities, a call to ensure that every town in America is no longer a border town. In the words of Ronald Reagan, quote, a nation that cannot control its borders is not a nation, end quote. The time for action is now. Congress cannot stand by. So we arrive at an inevitable conclusion that I do not take lightly. Secretary Mayorkas, you must resign. Will you resign? No, I will not. I am incredibly mm -hmm. proud of the work that is performed I understand. in the Department of Secretary Home. Mayorkas, if you will not resign, that leaves us with no other option. You should be impeached. And I yield back to the chairman. Uh, we, will, we will stand in recess, uh, Mr. Secretary, for uh, approximately 30 minutes. So I'd like to get started at 2.10, 2.15. And then we have, uh, I think, four, possibly five more. But, but that should go pretty quick. And there's, I think we got sandwiches and things back there for you if, if you need that. But we'll be back in approximately 30 minutes.